This is uh, Newton Cook, and welcome to all who are on our uh, recreation uh, forum tonight. Uh, we're going to start off uh, the, with uh, the executive director of the South Florida Water Management District, uh, uh, Mr. Drew Bartlett, is with us. And uh, Drew has a few words to start the meeting. And uh, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Newton. Uh, and thanks, as always, for being available to help coordinate and facilitate this a very important uh, recreational public forum. I see we still have some attendees streaming in and so I look forward to everyone attending this meeting. So uh, this forum is critical for us because we have about 400,000 acres uh, of public land at the water management district that we manage and most of that is you know has public access to it. So you know, we need forums like this to work through issues and, and uh, communicate and make sure everyone's aware of what's going on at the water management district. So I really appreciate this forum. I've, I've attended all but one of them uh, because I always learn something when I attend this. The one thing I wanted to point out was last week I presented our budget, which starts next year, October 1st. Um, and it is a significant budget. It's about a $1.2 million billion budget. Most of that is with Everglades and ecosystem restoration capital projects, large reservoirs, stormwater treatment areas and the like. 739 million of it is for that. And then we have about 70 million for science and water and 70 million for land stewardship, uh, which is what we you know, uh, invest in our lands for those recreational purposes and public use purposes, in addition to exotics control and burns and all the things necessary for a healthy ecosystem. I wanna point out that we have Stephen Collins joining us tonight. He's the division director uh, in the executive team over the real estate and land stewardship area. And so I'm, I'm glad he's able to participate with us. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to express my appreciation for our partnerships with uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. We do a lot of good work together and also our partnerships with the federal parties, whether that's interior with the refuge or the park system or fish and wildlife in general. So, you know, we couldn't get it done alone. And so these partnerships were critical for to make sure we have a, you know, good land management uh, with good recreation in our lands. So uh, Newton, I totally look forward to this agenda. I'm gonna be around the whole time and uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Drew. Uh, very much appreciate you joining us with these meetings. Uh, I think we're about uh, 15 years into these meetings now, and uh, the district has always been very supportive of uh, all the different recreators. Uh, I keep reminding people it's uh, anglers, hikers, bikers, uh, even the stargazers, not just the hunters uh, that are involved in these meetings, and we uh, horseback riders and campers, and we look forward to hearing from all of them. So with that, I'll go through a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you wish to comment out there uh, with these Zoom meetings, all you have to do is use your hand feature, on, raise your hand feature on Zoom. If you're on the phone, I, I, it's a star nine, and that will uh, uh, alert uh, Yvette that you would like to make a comment. Now, we do this a little different than some of the other meetings because we're a more open meeting. Uh, we can't be as open as we once were when we met in person but we try to replicate that as much as possible. So after each presentation, there will be an opportunity for anyone who would like to make a comment uh, to make a comment and please use the raise your hand or the uh, or star nine and you will be recognized. And when you make a comment, again, uh, unlike a lot of meetings, we do not have a rule about three minutes or two minutes, but we do have obviously a need for people uh, to be uh, uh, brief and to give time to others. Uh, we do have to cl close this meeting out by eight o'clock. So we will be moving at a rapid rate to do so. So with that, we will uh, go into our first presentation. And this is the Everglades Complex of Wildlife Management Areas and the high water closure process, which a number of us, of course, have, have uh, been speaking with the district and the FWC about uh, in the last month or so. And our presenter is Marsha Ward. She's the assistant regional biologist 
from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ward, and we look forward uh, to your presentation. Thank you so much, Newton. Thank you to the South Florida Water Management District for having this meeting and inviting me this evening. Again, my name is Marsha Ward and I'm an assistant regional biologist with FWC. I've been with FWC for about 15 years and I spent many of those years working in the Everglades before taking on a regional role. I'm glad to speak with you about our Everglades complex of wildlife management areas and the high water closure process. Ms. Ward, you do have... Oh, there it goes. Okay. Thank you. The FWC has fish and wildlife and land management responsibilities for the Everglades Complex of Wildlife Management Areas. The complex is made up of three WMAs. Everglades, which is made up of water conservation areas 2, 2A and 2B, and 3, which is 3A and 3B, Holy Land, and Rotenberger. Together, they total about 737,000 acres. The FWC manages for land stewardship, fish and wildlife conservation, and fish and wildlife-based outdoor recreation. We work cooperatively with both the South Florida Water Management District and the Miccosukee Tribe in the management of these areas. Habitats across the area include sawgrass whale, upland tree islands, cypress dome islands, wet prairie, and freshwater slough. FWC biologists have a guiding management plan for the Everglades complex of WMAs that directs goals and activities such as tree island restoration, management of invasive species, prescribed burning, and recreation. The Everglades complex of WMAs provides habitat for many wildlife species, and because we're talking about the Everglades, water plays an important role. FWC's role in water management is coordination and providing input to our partnering agencies. For example, we provide ecological recommendations through interagency calls. We provide input on recommendations for wildlife and habitat needs. We also coordinate agency commenting for Everglades restoration projects that could affect these w WMAs. We work with our partners to develop water management recommendations that take a multi-species approach to ensure protection of Florida's fish and wildlife resources for their benefit and the benefit of the public. Water that is too high or too low for too long can negatively affect the Everglades complex of WMA's wildlife and their habitats. When we have high water, we work with our partners to keep an eye on current conditions and develop solutions. FWC biologists monitor the deer herd in the Everglades complex through ways like aerial surveys, which is pictured on the left, and by collecting biological and use data at check stations. This helps us better manage the deer herd and provide opportunities like hunting to the public. Typically, under normal conditions, Everglades deer will spend most of their time browsing in the marsh, and fewer than 10 deer will be seen during a levee spotlight survey. The table on this slide shows validation surveys that we conducted in 2007 to help illustrate that deer do not prefer levee habitat, which provides little quality food or cover. When water levels rise too high, it can be detrimental to the deer herd. Deer and other terrestrial wildlife respond to high water levels by moving to higher locations like tree islands, spoil islands, and levees. These sites will provide some forage and refuge and fawning sites if it's spawning season. When they are restricted to higher ground, the food is limited and it's less palatable and less nutritious than compared to their preferred foods and stress levels are increased. Stressed wildlife can also be chased from levees and tree islands and are more likely to be involved in deer vehicle collisions on levees. High water can also negatively affect the tree island habitat. The health of Everglades deer is related to water levels, and it's always important that high water events are as short-lived as possible for the overall health of the deer herd. High water events can put many significant resources and wildlife at risk. These photos show some of the wildlife and habitats that can be affected by high water. In general, terrestrial wildlife are more vulnerable to disease, starvation, and predation during high water events, but it can, it can affect all of the natural resources that are listed here. 
To help during high water events, we restrict public access to most of the area, but allow compatible uses like frogging and fishing. Levees are closed to help reduce deer vehicle collisions and stress to already stressed wildlife. We try to do our best to keep the public informed through ways like posting signs, press releases, posting information on our website and reaching out to our key stakeholders. Again, we take a multi-species approach when we recommend water levels and most Everglades wildlife will benefit from water levels that range up to around one and a half feet with a peak of no more than two feet by the peak of the wet season. In the early 2000s, we dealt, developed keys to help inform high and low water action. So in 2005, we developed a high water key and in 2007, a low water key. The keys provide decision tools for determining if the area should be closed to public access. We use similar keys for all three of these WMAs, Everglades, Holy Land, and Rotenberger. The keys are based on our knowledge of wildlife needs, analyses of spotlight survey data, browsing and foraging observations and hydrologic modeling, where we took on the ground water level, me on the ground water level measurements and then related that to gauge reading so that we could understand average depths across the area. The Everglades high water key correlates gauge readings to water depths on average across Northern 3A. When we see average water depths of about two feet, we see terrestrial wildlife species using levees and tree islands for refuge. The graph on this slide shows the statistical relationship between observed deer on the L5 levee and water levels in 3A and helped inform our high water key. The key also uses or also includes reopening criteria. Spotlight survey numbers are used in combination with water levels to determine when conditions have improved for wildlife. And the keys for Holy Land and Rotenberger were developed using the same depth information. Even though the focus of the presentation is our high water closure, closure process, I did want to briefly mention the slow water key that we use to inform our low water closures. The key is based on when water levels are on average one foot below the surface over most of 3A North. It is based on data that we collected during extensive muck fires that occurred in northern 3A in 1999, where water levels were 1.3 to 2 feet below the ground surface. Muck fires burn the soil and can cause extensive damage, like the loss of tree islands that provide critical upland habitat to wildlife. Low water closures help reduce the risk of these damaging wildfires starting. The Everglades Key uses the 6-2 and 6-3 gauges, which are in Northern 3A. These have been correlated to average water depths across Northern 3A and typically water levels in 3A South will be higher. The high water closure criterion is 11.60 feet, which correlates to that average depth of two feet across Northern 3A, and when we start to see the terrestrial species using levees and tree islands for refuge. In Holy Land, we use the G203D gauge, and Rotenberger, we use, use the average of the Rotenberger North and Rotenberger South gauges. The key includes considerations for hunting seasons, makes recommendations to cancel upcoming hunts if necessary, and also trying to be considerate of stakeholders in our hunting community. Spotlight surveys and wildlife monitoring are used in co combination with the water levels to determine when the conditions have improved for wildlife and the closure can be lifted. When water levels recede, there is still potential for negative wildlife impacts. Wildlife will still sometimes be near levees and islands and can be stressed due to malnutrition. So we're careful not to reopen the area too soon after water, le water levels recede. FWC monitors, oops. FWC monitors wildlife and habitat conditions throughout high water events in a variety of ways. During high water events, we conduct wildlife monitoring, including the levee spotlight surveys, tree island browse surveys, water level monitoring, ecological recommendations to water management agencies, and camera trapping on tree islands. We do take events like this very seriously and do not act lightly. However, we try to protect wildlife and balance the needs of the public and consider that important 
We use all available data that we have to inform and make decisions. The photos on here on this slide are a marsh rabbit, a flooded tree island, which is one of our restoration islands, and spotlight surveys, stranded deer, and also fawns that were recorded on a camera during a spring high water event. Our levee spotlight surveys demonstrate the relationship between water levels in the marsh and terrestrial wildlife use of levees for refuge. Again, usually Everglades deer are browsing in the marsh and less than 10 deer will be seen during a spotlight survey. The map on the left shows the different levees that FWC biologists survey for wildlife during high water events. Rotenberger is highlighted in red, the levees for Holy Land are in yellow, and Everglades in green. On the right, I pulled 2016 levy spotlight surveys as an example to show this relationship. Week one indicates the surveys that started at the beginning of the event, and then each week is shown as the event continues. The blue bars indicate deer counts, and the lower black dash line indicates 10 deer. The upper black dash line is our high water level mark. You can see how the counts drop off as deer move off the levee when water levels drop below the criterion. Again, criteria to rescind a closure or restriction is a combination of water levels and wildlife observations on the levee. As, wa as water levels drop, wildlife have delayed responses and conditions sometimes don't improve for at least a week or more. During spotlight surveys, we also record other terrestrial wildlife, such as possums, marsh rabbits, raccoons, and bobcats. This is a pretty busy graph, but I did just want to continue to illustrate that we consistently see, see the same response by deer during high water events, which is how we originally developed our high water key back in 2005. This graph shows a selection of five high water events from the past, and the week one will indicate the beginning of the high water event, and then each week's water level information and deer observed on the levee spotlight survey. Like the last graph, the top black dash line is our high water line and the bottom black dash line is the indicator of deer responding to high water. And anything over 10 is unusual. You can see that as water levels, which are depicted by the dotted lines decrease, so does the deer, which is depicted by bars. You can also see that lag effect. When water levels decrease, it can take wildlife a little time to respond and disperse back into the area. In addition to the levee surveys, we conduct tree island browse surveys weekly during high water events to document the use of tree islands by deer and other terrestrial wildlife. Staff will collect observations and data on browsing pressure, wildlife observations, and document any dead wildlife found on these higher elevation tree islands across the areas. As a high water event continues, we'll see an increase in pressure and use of the islands. We also place cameras on some tree islands to document wildlife and use wildlife use and their condition during high water events, which is where a lot of the photos in this presentation are from. The map on the right shows the tree islands that we do browse surveys on. All the tree islands are in green, and then the islands that are part of our browse surveys are shown in red. The map in the lower center shows the five dead deer that we've documented from this year's high water event, and one of which was a deer vehicle collision on a levee in Rotenberger. For the Tree Island Browse Islands, we have six islands in Holy Land we typically survey, five in Rotenberger, and 33 that are in Everglades from Northern 3A, Southern 3A, and 3B. Fortunately, the high water event in 2020 so far appears not to be an extreme event. Water levels are not as high as in some past events, and the duration appears like it will be brief. It's been a little bit interesting. We had a near high water event in June, water levels briefly receded and then rose back to the closure in August. We saw deer on levees in response to these rising water levels. Water levels have now receded below the criterion for Everglades and Holy Land, and we saw wildlife responding. Spotlight surveys showed decreased use of levees and pressure from deer using tree islands continued to decrease. 
we were able to open both of these areas late last week. The chart on the slide uh, for water levels, you've got green showing normal average water levels and then blue showing this year. The red lines show the high or the low action lines. The lower graph shows spotlight surveys from this year. Weeks one through three were conducted during that near high water event. And then two weeks later, we resumed the spot, levy spotlight surveys for the high water event, which is weeks four through nine or four through 10. We strive for sound management of our wildlife and the habitats they rely on. We always try to balance user access with protection of our natural resources. During high water events, we can usually still keep some areas and opportunities open. For example, the portion of 3A South that is south of I-75 and east of the Miami Canal remains open, as well as water conservation areas 2 and B. And both of these areas are circled in yellow on the map. We also leave canals open for fishing, frogging, waterfowl, and alligator harvest. We work with our partners to share information and recommendations to help keep water, high water events as short-lived as possible. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are anybody out there who would like to make a public comment or comment on this, please raise your hand if you're on Zoom or hit star nine to raise your hand and you will be recognized. Mr. Cook, I have Daniel Watson followed by Dewey Mixon. Welcome. Good evening, Newton. Um, I want to thank uh, I want to thank Mr. Bartlett, Mr. Cook, and uh, Miss Ward for putting this together. Uh, Miss Ward for the presentation, and I believe we started the presentation with uh, talking about a multi-species approach to this uh, high water process, and I believe it's a single species approach that is the reason behind this high water process. And I'll be the first to say the uh, Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow today. Um, but I just wanted to point out that while we keep fishing um, going during the high water events, fishing is a year round activity. Uh, a lot of the access was cut off for us for hunting after the first week of archery and all through muzzleloader season. And those are only a once a year uh, event. Archery is one month and muzzleloader is two weeks. And we lost the opportunity to, to have access during those times. Um, the, the past five years, we've had a high water event every hunting season. And probably before that too, that's just the last I can remember. Every, every year we're cut off in archery for high water. Um, and it's just strange to me that we have a low water event in the end of April, early May, and then a near high water event in June. Uh, maybe we could see about even in these out so we don't have a low water event followed less than a month later by a high water event or a near high water event that shuts off access for, for folks that spend all year getting ready to hunt maybe two weeks out of the year during muzzleloader and then have no access. And I also just wanted to ask Ms. Ward, have you ever seen any Panthers on your spotlight surveys? Cause I didn't hear any mention of that. And thank you for your time. Next is Mr. Dewey Mixon. Hi, how you doing? Um, my name is Dewey Mixon. I was just curious because when we go the, when we go through these high water events, um, they close, you know, they close the Everglades down for public access, and the water technically it may be high on the north side of 75, but on 3A South the water is nearly dry, not dry, but it's it's super low. 
Um, you can, it's, it's not really, it's, there's really no point of, you know, going down when it gets below a certain point and then all of a sudden it's closed due to high water. Um, why is it closed due to high water? Because there is no water on our side of on three a South. You can't even get into any of like L 28 at the microwave tower. You can't even get into the canal because you're going to hit rocks getting in with an airboat. Um, when you, when you have that event of high water and on, maybe on the north side of on 3A North going by gauge 62 and 63, but when you go, you know, down to gauge 18, which is at the east west at the corner of the east west trail at the at the uh, the county line where it turns, that it's it's almost dry there, and we're going through a high water event, which doesn't make any sense, and just trying to get a clarification because I've been there when the water is extremely high and the, and the glades are open where there's water almost up to the camps. And then I've been there where it's, I haven't, I haven't been able to get there when it's, when it's prime time, when you would consider prime time to go down there when the water's flowing, you know, through the, through the canals and it's, it's an enjoyable ride. You can go ride a lot of places and the, and it's closed due to high water and it's not even high. And that's just, I just would like clarification of that. Next is Mr. Mike Elfenbein. Yeah. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Hi, Yvette. Thanks for doing a great job as always. You're the best. Um, thanks to the staff, Drew, Marsha, for everybody for this great presentation and for another wonderful recreation meeting. Uh, Newton for your dedication. Thank you guys. Um, I just had a question. I, so in the past, it seems to me that the, I get that the other meetings aren't so uh, responsive, but in the past, this rec forum usually has allowed for an exchange of dialogue and it seems like we're skipping over that this time. I just want to be sure, but um, usually we're able to ask questions and there's an opportunity for some responses here. So just as it relates to the deer survey, I was taking some notes and I obviously we see that week, you know, 12, 13 week period of high water um, and the graphs, but uh, are these surveys being conducted the rest of the year, the other 40 or so weeks out of the year? Is there some kind of baseline that we're going on or is it just simply uh, high water, we check it, then it goes down and we don't check it again? Can, can someone provide some clarity on that? Um, Marcia, are you still on? I'm still here, Newton. I just wasn't sure um, if we, if everyone spoke and then we took questions or how you wanted me to help with this. Yeah, you, you're welcome to respond here if you have a response to the couple of comments that have been made to this point. Okay, I will try. I might, for, I might forget some of them. Um, I know that the first speaker had asked about why we, why I talked a lot about deer and I just I did, I just wanted to answer that we, um, terrestrial wildlife are pretty vulnerable to high water events and we use deer as the indicator. So deer are pretty good indicator species of when terrestrial wildlife are being affected by high water events. So, and they're, um, so that's kind of why we focus on deer for, for that. Um, and typically when water levels in 3A North are high, they are high throughout the rest of water conservation area three and usually and um, 3B as well. It's usually like a system-wide issue when we're having a high water event. There could be some portions of the area that are higher maybe in Western 3A near the Carmichael's or something which might be um, what he was referring to. The question that Mike had on our surveys. So typically we now just do surveys during the high water event. We usually start our levee spotlight surveys when we see water levels rising, so the week or two leading up if we can, sometimes it's too quick and we just kind of have to get right out there. And then we'll survey until the high water event is passed. We have done validation surveys in the past just to help show that deer are not on the levee um, outside of that. So we did validation surveys where we surveyed throughout the whole year just to help document that. Also, my staff are out there working throughout the year. So it, it is something that both stakeholders and law enforcement and staff notice when we start to see a lot of deer on the levees. 
that's kind of what happened when water levels were rising this year at the beginning of our archery season. We had the first weekend of archery right when the water levels were rising again. And there were a lot of stakeholders who came to us noting the increased number of deer on the levees. I'm not sure if I got all the questions that everyone had. So if I missed any, please let me know. Thank you, Marcia. I think you did a great job. Yvette, do we have any other uh, questions? Next is followed by Matt Garski. First, can you please unmute? Hello, can you hear me now? We can hear you, thank you. Cool. Um, well, first of all, again, thank you all for putting this all together for us to comment and answer our questions. Um, my first uh, question is, I am very, very, very concerned about the future of the Everglades because there is a current restoration project uh, known as the West Everglades Restoration Project that has proposed to put an additional 18 inches, up to 18 inches of water uh, to add during the hydro periods in 3A South. Um, I really don't see how during these high water events, we are going to be able to manage um, everything going on while there is 18 additional inches of water. There's going to be less control. And currently we are unable to send water south because of what Mr. Watson mentioned earlier, the seaside sparrow. Um, and I'm very, very, very concerned about the future of the Everglades. The deer are not going to do well with an additional 18 inches of water. The endangered Florida panther is not going to do well with an additional 18 inches of water on the ground. I am super concerned. I'm also concerned about the future of hunting in the areas because of this. Um, it seems a few years ago they were giving away a large amount of track permits for uh, Rotenberg or wildlife management area and those drastically got cut down. Um, I don't know, uh, a few years ago, not a few years ago, uh, probably about 15 years ago, there was a study done um, basically saying that if you kept most of your year and a half year old deer alive, you would, bucks alive, you would not hurt your deer population. That's why Florida used to be a five inch spike rule. Now, instead of, you know, possibly doing antler point restrictions like they did in the stair step unit of Big Cypress where they counted zero deer for multiple years on aerial surveys, they just closed it down. We just want to hunt. We just want to recreate. Instead of closing it down, make it three points on one side so any deer that is going to be harvested out there is going to be at least a two and a half to three and a half year old deer. Um, I'm just very, very, very concerned about the future of the Everglades and I hope you can answer the uh, couple of questions that I presented and hear the uh, hear the concerns that I have out and hopefully make uh, strong recommendations to the South Florida Water Management District and other entities um, that govern the rules, laws, and water flow in the Everglades. Thank you all for your time. Next is Mr. Wright. Bishop, can you please unmute? Yvette, this is James Thurston. While we're waiting for the next next public speaker, can I go ahead and address that gentleman's comment? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. I just I just want to let him know that there are a number of biologists, including staff from FWC, working on the Western Everglades project, and you know we are working together with the ecological sub team and the Army Corps of Engineers and members from the Water Management District all looking to make sure we get the hydrology right out there on that Western Everglades project. We do know that it is a very sensitive environment and all the biologists that are involved working on it are, are really targeting the biological parameters that support the ecology of the area. Um, the conditions are very different in Western Everglades, but when we come to a final product over there and a final alternative, I think you'll be very pleased with the outcomes that come in the future. Um, the, the response to being 18 inches of water, you know, I don't know where specifically in the 
in the area of Big Cypress should be looking at that. But I go ahead and offer myself too offline outside of this meeting that you can reach out to me at any time and we can walk through some of that Western Everglades information. As well, there are public meetings with the core where you can walk through some of that information. Um, so it's a little different environment in the Western Everglades and in the Big Cypress area than it is in the water conservation area, which has a confining levy around the entire, entire virtually the entire um, Everglades wildlife management area. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Wright, have you, can you unmute please? We'll skip Mr. Wright for now. Um, Don Carlson. Oh, good evening. Thanks for hearing me. I'll make it kind of short. I'm gonna tack, uh, tack on to what Danny Watson was saying. The single species management to me seems to be the biggest issue of not sending water south of Tamiami Trail. Until we can tackle that problem, I think we're just spinning our wheels. And we're gonna keep ruining the Everglades continually. Uh, thanks for everybody. That's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Mr. Brandon James. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Um, I was just uh, asking about um, the boat ramps on uh, 27, you know, north of the alley, the first and second one. Does anybody have a, you know, a final decision on which one they're going to keep, if they're going to keep any of them? So I don't know if anybody has an answer to that. Um, and that, that's pretty much it. That might, that might be a question or it might be answered later in the meeting uh, when they give an update on uh, the different things uh, out there. That is one of the things we have been looking at. So uh, you might hear an update on that tonight. Uh, we'll definitely be sure we get one for the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. The next speaker I have is a telephone number ending in 6323, followed by Mr. S um, Sean Scanlon. Hello, uh, John Rozier. Sorry, my name didn't come up there. Um, Marcia, I, I just think a lot of people don't understand why the south gets closed, south of the alley gets closed, and north of the alley gets closed at the same time. Um, you know, the, everybody says, oh, there's no deer south of the alley and all. I really think that you guys need to, and I don't, I don't know exactly how to do it. I know if I, I've asked the question and I've tried to pass it on, but, but how you guys manage the deer herd and what size you manage the deer herd at and are there a large amount of deer south of the alley? Because every time we have a closure, I get the same things. Oh, there's no deer south of the alley. I know there is, you know there is, um, you know, but they're not where people think they are. So um, if there's any easy answer to that, or maybe you could put that out. But, but that's, I think that's one of the biggest questions that, that people have. And, and as, uh, as far as the gentleman talking about Rotenberger having a whole mess of permits, well, they got to know there's no deer in Rot. I, I take it back. There are deer in Rotenberger, but not a sustainable herd at this time. It has been static. You know, it's been steady, which is good. It's not declining, and it slowly will come up. Um, so if you could address, you know, perhaps that, that question might help a lot of people understand why when you make a closure for high water it affects both sides of the alley thank you thanks john um yeah so typically when water levels are high in, in northern three they're going to be high throughout the rest of the area too and we do see terrestrial wildlife affected in Southern 3A as well. A lot of the pictures and even the video with the fawns, I think it played, um, was from 3A South. So there aren't as many deer in 3A South as 3A North, but we do still have deer and other species, other terrestrial wildlife species there. Um, we have seen the herd declining over the last few years. So we've been trying to monitor that. We, through our aerial surveys and um, 
we have reduced some of our uh, airboat permits there accordingly. So we are monitoring that and have seen it on a decline, but we do still have our deer herd there. I think the only other thing to mention for Rotenberger, we do still have our walk seasons in Rotenberger, but we have not been issuing track permits in Rotenberger for the last um, few years. Like John mentioned, we've, we've seen the herd decline and not be at a stable place at this point. There was one other question that I, I realized that someone asked earlier if we, and I forgot to answer it, and if we ever saw panthers on our spotlight surveys. And we don't see them very often, but we do occasionally see them. We did actually see a panther during this year's high water event levy spotlight surveys, somewhere around the middle, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. The next caller is Mr. Sean Scanlon, followed by Betty Osceola. How you doing? Sean Scanlon here. Um, I had a few questions uh, as far as recreational use, and then obviously um, we all need to make a comment about the Seaside Sparrow. Um, clearly, it's a big issue if we can't get the water from one area to another, um, and holding it in 3A North is clearly a problem for our deer herd. Everything that was in your and your presentation about high water was terrible for the deer. Every, they're getting hurt in that situation. Um, the Everglades Restoration Project, I've heard as well, this additional 18 inches. Um, you say it's in the Big Cypress area where that water is going to go, but it's got to come from the north. So there's going to be majority of that 18 inches during the high water air times that that water is going to get diverted, let alone natural issues with rain, things that happen. Um, second part of all this is our uh, access for camp owners. Um, currently I've been shut out of the Everglades for nine weeks now. I got nine weeks of grass to cut, maintenance to do, all of this stuff. Um, I've called multiple times over the last few years and spoke with the North Lake Field Office about getting a permit, yet to date I've been told, I've been denied every time for a, a day use permit to go out there and check on our stuff, cut the grass, do our maintenance items that we need to do. Um, that's kind of our, my biggest problem with it um, is that we're not allowed to check on the stuff that we pay for lease wise. Um, I'd really like uh, if you could comment back on all that. Okay, thank you. Um, Betty Osceola, please. Please unmute. So, Ciola, can you please unmute? We'll move on to Mr. Mike Melton and we'll come back to Ms. Osceola. Yes, hi, good evening, Mike Melton. Uh, I just wanted to echo Danny Watson's comments. Uh, you know, I've mentioned the, the issues with the Seaside Sparrow at a bunch of these meetings in the past. Um, and I'm also concerned about the lo loss of hunter access uh, with the high water issues that, that result from all that. Uh, I did have a question. Um, and actually, before I go any further, I wanted to thank uh, Ms. Ward and everyone, all staff, for putting on this uh, presentation in this meeting. Um, my one question was, um, I appreciate that you're monitoring the deer populations um, or the deer activity. Um, is there any study or, you know, data going going around regarding the tree islands and how they're affected by the high water? Uh, if there's a, you know, if they're diminishing uh, or if they're staying the same or, or how these high water are affecting the tree islands that these um, animals depend on to survive. So uh, thank you again for, for the presentation. Uh, Yvette, this is Newton. Now, I want you to know I'm letting this run a little longer uh, than you would uh, probably like uh, in time because this is the big issue. I'm looking at the meeting agenda, and this is the issue that probably will get the most public comments, and we want to be sure the folks out there have a chance. So that's the reason we're letting this run on a little longer, but it probably will mean we're going to have to go a little faster as we get towards the end of the meeting. But thank you for all for the comments, and we look forward to hearing from the rest of the folks.
Marsha, would you like to provide um, a feedback on that last commenter? Sure. Um, we, you know, I think actually it might be good to follow up on it later just because I know that the district is actually doing some really great work and research on tree islands and um, their responses to different water levels. So we do collect yeah. some information ourselves, but the district is probably going to have a little bit better uh, quantitative data on that. Yeah, hey, this is Drew Bartlett. Uh, Fred Sklar and his group has has a lot of data and, and research on the, the impacts of tree islands, of which there are impacts to tree islands due to high water levels. Um, he presented it a little bit at the last RAC meeting, um, but certainly if you contact the district and we can put you in touch with Fred Sklar because there's a lot of good data on that and there are absolutely impacts. Great, thank you, Drew. Next speaker is Tom Van Note. Thank you. Um, thank the South Water Water Management District for hosting this forum. Uh, Newton, a pleasure as always. Marsha, thank you, and Drew. Um, I'm just adding my name to the chorus about the single species uh, management of the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow. Um, we, before moving forward with anything that needs to be addressed, because it will help us move um, forward with the proper management of the area, get water back in that area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our last speaker is Mr. Matt Garth. Hey, you, um, I, I spoke a, a little bit ago at the beginning of the meeting, but um, a couple of my questions uh, kind of seem to have gotten lost. Um, well, the first question, well, the main question is, as a professional biologist, in your opinion, would sending water south of the Tamiami Trail help the Everglades maintain its hydrology and reduce high water events? And my other question was, why did we jump to just removing hunting in a certain, certain area, just removing the track hunt rather than having antler point restrictions on the area? That's it. Thank you, guys. I can address the um, the deer question. We do have antler point restrictions. We have forked antler restrictions for Everglades, Holy Land, and Rotenberger. So I did just want to answer that one. And I think I'm not sure if James would like to address the other question. Thank you, Marsha. I can I can help out a little bit on the other one. This is James Erskine, Everglades coordinator with FWC. And when you talk about remove, when you talk about sending water south of Tamiami Trail, moving water south of Tamiami Trail definitely helps high water conditions in Area Three or in the Everglades wildlife management areas. That is the process to evacuate water from the area. But we're always stuck with the we're always stuck in a certain paradigm, and that is the Everglades has been greatly reduced in size, but rainfall stays static over that same period in which the Everglades has been reduced in size. So from a, not from a biological, but from a water management standpoint, there's a lot more water going into a less of a land surface. So moving water down and moving it through into Northeast Shark River Slough is one of the best ways to get water out of 3A and help prevent High water conditions or help alleviate a high water condition when it has developed. Um, but with that being said, there are there are still roadblocks in the way, even moving it down, even moving it to the east and into Shark River Slough. There are roadblocks in the way, and there are construction projects that are going on right now to help remove some of them. Thank you. Uh Yvette, is, uh, Betty, is Betty Osceola, is there a chance that she can get on? We'd like to hear from her if possible. Yes, Mr. Cook, I have four more hands that raised in the meantime. Oh, okay. I have, um, next is Mr. Paul Gray, followed by Betty Osceola. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, this is Paul Gray from Audubon, Florida. Um, when we talk about why the WCA3 gets too deep, um, there's, there's a lot of reasons. And there's something like nine structures that can drain the water. 
the W-12s or all four of them are considered one of those nine. And to have two of them shut down for half the year, it reduces their capacity by about one four. And one of the nine structures have its capacity reduced by about one fourth. That's not really the real reason why WCA3 has water levels problems. And if you look at, you know, who puts water in the WCA3, um, it's not the sparrows. They never put a drop of water there, maybe a little poop. Um, but um, there's big agricultural areas north of the WCAs that drain water into them, especially when there's a whole lot of water. Where the wetter it is, the more water they put in there. Um, the urban areas on the Lower East Coast can put water in there. The urban areas also like to keep them relatively deeper uh, to protect water supply. And so when the WCA3 has a deep water problem and everybody says, what's going on? Who's doing this? Well, for the people contributing to this, it's, it's far more comfortable to say, hey, it's that bird. <laughs> Blame it on the bird. And they kind of try to not talk about their contribution to the problem. And so um, I just hope everybody looks at this a little bit more closely and doesn't take such a simplistic idea. And, you know, especially when conservation minded people are blaming uh, wildlife species for human activities and human created situations, I find that a little bit distressing. So try to think about this more, try to learn more about it. Um, there's a lot more going on. Thank you. Next is Betty Elciola. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, thank you. Sorry, I was having to I think out of everybody that's been on the line before me, well, um, I'm a Miccosukee tribal member and I actually live out in the Everglades, um, unlike all the people that was spoke before me. And I kind of have to disagree with Mr. Gray there. Um, for my tribe, the sparrow is a big issue, especially when we do our ceremonies and access uh, 3A and when water can't flow naturally like, and I understand the Everglades is reduced, but there's still a lot of barriers. And before High uh, Tamiami Trail was put in, the water flowed where the sparrow are. So that is an issue for uh, myself and what my tribe reiterates. And a lot of speakers that came before me, I do agree with them that until you address the entire system to get the water flow, not this, um, engineered type of water flow that everyone else advocates for, but getting the water to flow south as nature had intended and remove some of these blockages, you're still going to have these issues. And when more water is put into the system with work, because you're going to plan to backfill some of those uh, canals and was it the L28 and the L28 interceptor and some of the tieback, you are going to get more increased water flow. And then you have people um, advocating for more water to go into 3A even during the dry season. I think now that's the, um, the new movement now. So you, you have to take a system-wide approach and analyze this because the sparrow is a problem. When you close those gates, Tamiami Trail is a problem. How are they gonna look at the future needs of getting that water to actually flow? Because right now, shunting it over to the east isn't historic natural flow. It also flowed to the west. And I, can, I could never understand why you want to water starve the western side of the Everglades. And I'm happy to see that, you know, people are looking at WERP, but I'm also concerned about, about the water depth that uh, if WERP brings in that water, how they're going to get it out of the system. So, it, you know, there's all these issues. And I'm glad the presentation on um, the high water closure, because, because I'm a Miccosukee tribal member, I still have access and I monitor the area along with the tribe's wildlife officers. And when I was out there during your high water closure, I was kind of scratching my head looking for the high water, especially in 3A South. And I went 3A North over there by Tom Shirley's Island and I was still looking for some high water. So I was kind of curious as to 3A South, what is considered high water? Because during your closure, I, I wasn't seeing it, but again, I'm not a, a scientist, a biologist or whatever. I'm just an Indian who actually lives in the Everglades and is always out there. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Mr. Kyle Arkaki. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that name right. Hello, uh, thank you for uh, letting us comment. I, uh, I missed the presentation. I don't know if there's any way I could have you email that over to me. I got out of work late, but um, I would also 
I'm just calling in to comment about the single species management. It's got to end. The uh, seaside sparrow is pretty much killing the rest of the Everglades. Um, and I also agree with Betty Osceola. I didn't, I didn't see any high water out there either. Along Driving along 27 or Alligator Alley really didn't seem that high to me. Um, thanks for letting us comment. Thank you. Next is Sean Scanlon. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, none of my answers got question. Uh, none of my questions got answered. Uh, I feel like I got skipped there. Uh, we, might have, we might have to answer your questions. Uh, uh, if you would like to uh, email them to Yvette or something, uh, she will see to it that you get answers. Uh, I'm the only one that got skipped on this whole deal. That's the problem. Okay, well, well, do you remember what your question was? Would you just Absolutely. tell us your question? Yes, sir. Uh, first, I started out with the seaside sparrow being an issue. Um, and then going back to what the gentleman said about we are just blaming this on a bird. It's more than that. Yes, it's a human project uh, problem. Yes, the Everglades is reduced. But this is single species management. You're letting all these fur bearing animals get hurt over this one bird. You kind of got to make the choice. I mean, this, uh, that, that was my first part. My second part was um, for camp owners, people who use the area regularly. Um, maybe I'm myself, I go out there every weekend that it's open. If the camp owners can't get to their camps to take care of this stuff and do their maintenance, the buildings start to look bad. They, you know, just like if you don't paint your house, it looks like shit in a few weeks, or I mean a few years. Um, that being said, we're having this high water issue right now. My inspections in January. Um, I've never been issued a day use permit and I've talked to Donnie in the field offices multiple, multiple times and I've always been denied. Is there any way that we, camp owners can get access during these high water events? Is, is, is that a question for the FWC or the water management district? Well, this is from what I understand, uh, Marshall Ward's the regional biologist and every slide in here has a Florida Fish and Wildlife tag in the corner of it. So I figured this would be a good time to bring that question up. Okay. Well, thank you for bringing it up. And uh, uh, we, we will try to get back to you on that. I, I don't think we can do it tonight. Can I leave uh, my email with you? And can yes, I have yours? Yes, you can. And you can email uh, uh, either uh, Yvette or, or the FWC, and I'm sure they'll get back to you. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, we do need to move on because obviously I've let this purposely run for an extra 30 minutes. I, this is a big issue, a giant issue, and we had a lot of the public out there who wanted to comment. So uh, next we're going to call uh, Veronica Kelly, the Refuge Park Ranger uh, for the Arthur R. Marshall Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, welcome, Veronica. Hey, N Newton. Uh, this is yeah. Drew. Uh, yeah. I was just wanted to weigh in on the, the water levels and the, this the getting water into Everglades National Park. And I think the, um, you know, the champion on our water on our board at the Water Management District is Alligator Ron Bergeron. And I talk to him daily about uh, structure operation, uh, new projects and everything to try to get the water levels more balanced between 3A and Everglades National Park. And so that is absolutely something we're committed to do. Um, many of you see the construction we're doing to try to, you know, unclog Tamiami Trail uh, so that we can get water levels more balanced. He's looking and pushing us to look at culverts on the L28 as well. Um, I have I had a letter exchange with Larry Williams at Fish and Wildlife about the Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow. Uh, the district is inter interested in protecting and sustaining the sparrow itself, but also very interested in having more flexibility and operations for the same reason everyone's commented upon. Um, and so I did have a positive exchange. Uh, Fish and Wildlife for the first time said they were going to look at changing operations and changing closure criteria. And a lot of that is based on the investments and our capability of moving water to different places, particularly down Shark River Slough. Um, so uh, it was great to hear Betty Osceola's voice. It's been way too long and, and I, I look forward to working with you. Um, I will certainly look into the 
uh, water levels and how we look at that in 3A South versus 3A North, that was a new comment I had heard. Uh, but I just wanted to sort of weigh in and say that we are at the Water Management District are engaged on all fronts to try to get these water levels more appropriate uh, in this system that has been way too modified by man and we need to get that fixed. So thank you, Newton, for giving me the time and we can go into this presentation. Well, well, thank you very much, Drew. And I have to say that uh, this uh, governing board and yourself, uh, since you've been in the last year or so, has been uh, very uh, understanding about the problems uh, with uh, moving water south on the trail and how much grief it causes north of the trail. We're not able to do so. So with that, uh, uh, Veronica, uh, Kelly, are you out there and ready? Ms. Kelly, you do have control. Please unmute. Veronica, hey, can you can, unmute? Yeah, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Thank you. I'm going to give <laughs> pass control back to you. Okay, hold on. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. So hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Veronica Kelly, and I'm a park ranger here at the Arthur R. Marshall Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. I wanted to say thank you so much for inviting Loxahatchee to provide an update on the Visitor Services Plan initiatives. Veronica, you can use the down at keys, arrow keys. Yeah, I'm trying that and it's not working. It, oh. It's, it's just it a little delayed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. So the refuge has been through several changes over the past few years. In 2017, there was a secretarial order with directives to expand hunting and fishing and increase outdoor recreation opportunities for all Americans. Then in February of 2018, a new license agreement with the South Florida Water Management District was negotiated and approved. And as part of the renegotiation, options for enhancing or expanding recreational opportunities were considered. So it's a great time to look at and reevaluate Loxahatchee's public use program. The refuge developed a visitor services plan to identify the goals, objectives, and strategies to reach over the next 15 years. It includes implementing and managing existing new and expanded wildlife dependent recreational opportunities to meet the purpose of the refuge and the mission of the National Wildlife Refuge System as a whole. For a little more than a year now, we've been implementing new recreational uses on the refuge. So that's what I'm gonna tell you about today. So the first changes were in Jul well, the first changes were in July of 2019. We increased refuge hours at the Hillsboro and the 20 mile bend entrances to be open 24 hours a day. There was no change at the, the headquarters area here in Boynton Beach. The gates at the headquarters are open daily from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, right now the visitor center is temporarily closed, but its normal operating hours are 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. In September of 2019, we opened the north end of the refuge to non-motorized watercraft. So I'm talking about the yellow area on the map where it says non-motorized zone. Over a thousand additional acres are open to canoeing, kayaking, photography, wildlife watching, and duck and coot hunting. Watercraft is not allowed on the tree islands, Strazula, or the ABNC impoundments. For everyone's safety, all boats operating outside of the perimeter canal in the refuge interior must fly a 10 by 12 inch orange flag 10 feet above the, ves the vessel's waterline. The white box with the canoe and a flag is an example of the sign that you will see near the boat launch area. Staff submitted hunting and fishing regulation changes earlier this year and just two weeks ago today we got word that the 2020-2021 hunt and fish rule is final and was published in the federal register. So that means the northern section of the refuge, again in the yellow color where it says non-motorized watercraft only on this slide, the 
the northern section of the refuge will be open to non-motorized watercraft for duck and coot hunting this year. This year's duck and coot hunts will match the hours and days specified by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So this means that duck and coot hunting will be open seven days a week and it will include all legal shooting hours. So the hunt will no longer end at 1 p.m. and will be open on Christmas Day. We will participate in all of the duck and coot hunts that FWC offers. And this includes early teal, early teal and wood duck, phase one, phase two, the youth hunt and the new veterans hunt. And there is also a new format to the hunt brochure, which can be found in the hunting section of our website. With the final fish rule, hunt fish rule being published, this also allows fishing in the non-motorized area. In addition to new acres open to fishing, we've also expanded the method of take to bow fishing and fish gigging too. Frog gigging is allowed from July 16th through March 15th of each year with a limit of 50 frogs per vessel or party. Frog gigging, bow fishing, and fish gigging are allowed in designated areas and all refuge regulations apply. This year is the first year in many that the refuge has issued permits for airboat use. The non-hunting airboat permit lottery took place in May and the first airboats launched onto the refuge in July. The dates for the permitted non-hunting airboats are from July through November on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, and that's outside of duck and coot seasons. There was an online process back in May and we received 18 applications and we issued 10 permits for 2020. Um, for the permitted area, which is the 13,900 acres in the green on the map. This year we offered all alligator hunters the opportunity to get an airboat hunt permit, or an airboat permit to hunt alligators with an airboat. So far only one alligator hunter has requested and has been issued an airboat permit. The duck and coot hunt airboat permit lottery will be open on our website from October 1st through the 15th and that will be for phase two of the state season running from December 12th of 2020 to January 31st of 2021. The airboat permits for deer hunting will be issued in 2021. In February of 2020, we opened the refuge to horseback riding. The green dotted line on the map shows 36 miles of trails on the perimeter levee from the S362 pump station to the S6 pump station. Riders can park at the boat ramp parking lots at the headquarters area in Boynton Beach or the Hillsboro area in Boca Raton. Gate modifications are underway and should be completed by December. We began allowing pets on the refuge in September of 2019, so just over a year now. Pet walking is allowed around the three boat ramp parking lots and on the perimeter levee, which is shown on this map in the neon pink color from the S362 pump station to the S6 pump station. All pets must be on a leash or confined in some way and pet owners must pick up after their pets. In July of 2019, we opened the refuge to instructor-led small groups by permit. We have two designated locations, the C6 Pavilion and a nice grassy space down at the Hillsboro area. There will be a maximum of two activities per month and no longer than two hours in, to in total duration. Some example topics might be yoga, martial arts, aerobics, astronomy, natural areas related instruction and others and that the special use permit application is available on our website. Similar to the last slide, we began allowing ceremonies by permit in July of 2019. The locations are the same as the instructor led small groups. Ceremonies can include a maximum of 50 people and can last up to four hours in total duration. Disturbances to visitors and wildlife will be minimized by limiting music to handheld instruments and there will be no balloons or rice, birdseed, confetti or plastic at the ceremony. The, there's a whole list of other special conditions on our website and along with a special use permit application to fill out. With all of the new and expanded recreational uses, we needed a new brochure. So it was first printed in October of 2019 and updated in May of 2020. 
The newest version of the brochure is in Spanish and both versions of the brochure are available on our website. So what's next? Uh, we're working on new entrances at Wellington and Strazula. We're planning on implementing our deer hunts during the 2021 season. For concessionaire operations at Hillsboro, Loxahatchee staff has been working with the Fish and Wildlife Service social scientist to interview key stakeholder groups. Staff will incorporate comments from stakeholder groups and then send to contracting. We hope by the spring that we'll have a contract out for bid. Camping might still be a year or two out. It depends on construction on the west side of the refuge. And now I'm available for questions. If you can't think of, if you have a question and, uh, and ever wanna email me, feel free to call or email and I'll be happy to help out where I can. And as always, you can stay up to date with what's happening on the refuge by checking our website or our Facebook page. Thank you very much, Veronica. Uh, for someone who has been involved with the refuge from about uh, 2000, the year 2000, it is an incredibly wonderful place. And in order to get this uh, extra uh, access for the public, it's taken years and years and years of work. And the staff at the refuge, they have to do years and years and years of work because of the bureaucracy of the federal government to add programs to wildlife refuges. So we cannot say thank you enough to uh, you, Veronica, and to uh, all, uh, all the different uh, stakeholders who have worked with us, and also uh, all the way up to, to Kathy, uh, who uh, has been very helpful, Brissette, and we sure appreciate it. Now, if we have any comments or questions here, please keep them brief as we need to move on at a faster pace. Thank you. Any questions, Jeanette? Yes, we do. We have three hands raised, Mike Melton, followed by Richard Martinez. Yes, hi, hi again. Uh, I just wanna say thank you to Ms. Kelly and uh, thank you to FWS. I, I appreciate the expanded recreational access, especially uh, hunting on uh, Loxahatchee. Um, and I look forward to hunting deer there in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Richard Martinez, followed by Mr. Wright. I wanted to thank staff uh, for hosting this meeting again online. I uh, really appreciate the accessibility this offers everybody. Um, just wanted to ask regarding deer hunting, if, uh, if it was going to be a quota hunt and if the quota rules had been established and, and what sort of uh, what harvest objectives or what harvest numbers was FWC considering in, in opening it up for deer hunting. Hi, Richard. The, the deer hunt will be scheduled for the 2021 season. So we really need to get back, um, go uh, look further into planning on that. There's a lot of details in the visitor services plan. Um, if you wanna send me an email, I can keep you up to date as we move along in the process. Great, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wright. Please unmute. If you're using a phone, please star nine um, to unmute star six. Mr. Wright, can you please unmute? Mr. Wright, I'll reach out to you. Um, my, next is Mr. Mike Elfenbein. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Yvette. I'll be quick here. I know we're in a hurry. I am very, very grateful to the service for doing this and for making sure this goes through. I saw Rolf on Tuesday in Jupiter at the president's uh, speech and had an opportunity to thank him personally for the hard work that you guys are doing. But it's very important that we, as recreationalists, understand that that work was done because the state had to strong arm the federal government into doing it. 
And that's important because as we go forward, especially with places like the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge, where a public access plan has been on hold for the last six years, it's important that we recognize that sometimes it takes that strong arming from a state agency on the federal agency to get something done. So Drew, I know you're listening and um, we know that it took to get Loxahatchee open for public access and uh, maybe um, you or others in state agency leadership, James, I know you're listening from the commission, um, might be able to flex some muscle on the refuge and get um, some more access to our public lands. Thank you guys. Thank you very much for uh, putting this plan together. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. We'll try Mr. Wright one more time. Um, go ahead, please unmute. Please look at the bottom right of the Zoom window. Okay. We're still having technical difficulties. Mr. Wright, I'll reach out to you again. Thank you. Mr. Cook, that's it for all uh, public commenters. Garrett, I'm going to pass control over to you. Brian? Yes. You ready to go? Yes, you have control. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Garrett. I am the uh, Wildlife Coordinator at the South Florida Water Management District for Operations and Maintenance. Uh, I gave an overview of our uh, Port Bassinger Gopher Tortoise recipient site uh, a couple of years ago, but we've been uh, using it for a few years, so we thought it'd be a good idea to go ahead and give a quick update. It's not moving forward. Brian, hit um, click on it one more time and... There we go. There, there is a delay. Okay. Yep, yep. Okay, so, uh, so Fort Boss Bassinger's location uh, is uh, right on the Kissimmee River. Uh, it's about a 20 minute to 25 minute drive from uh, the town of Okeechobee or about a 15 minute drive from uh, the town of Lorita. Uh, both of those uh, you'd be coming from on uh, Highway 98. So Fort Bassinger itself is 264 acres. Uh, you can see it here on the map. It's right off of the Kissimmee River, as I mentioned before, and it's in Highlands County. Uh, it's part of the Kissimmee River public use area. So areas like Hickory Hammock and Kisso are all part of this uh, conglomerate of properties we uh, maintain and operate um, uh, along the Kissimmee River. And the, the property is uh, open to a variety of public uses, including hunting, hiking, and camping. Port Bassinger was first permitted by FWC as a long-term uh, gopher tortoise recipient site back in 2017. Uh, what this does is it allows the district to relocate tortoises from project areas uh, to the Fort Bassinger property um, instead of having to go to outside uh, vendors who would take the uh, tortoises from us. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with gopher tortoises, what they look like, uh, on the left, I have a picture of, a, of an adult, uh, which they're sort of more of a, a gray to brown color. And then the juveniles are that sort of gold, uh, bright gold color, uh, yellow color. And um, that's, that's basically a juvenile from, they can be as small as about, not much bigger than uh, half a golf ball. And then uh, they grow, uh, slowly over the first few years. So a lot of the uh, areas these tortoises might be coming from would be like from water resource projects such as uh, the C43 is, is, a, is a good example. We've had a few tortoises that have come from that project. Uh, other areas would be areas like uh, levees and uh, berms that we have to help direct water throughout the district. Uh, 
Of course, Gopher tortoise burrows can be as deep as 10 feet, possibly even 15 feet below the surface of the ground. And they can run as far as just the length of the burrow can be as long as up to 30 feet in length. Uh, when I say uh, they run 30 feet in length is at the end of the, the burrow uh, tunnel itself, there's a chamber uh, at which the gopher tortoise resides a good portion of the time. And uh, that's, that could, that's what can actually be 30 feet um, down the tunnel. Now, the presence of, uh, of a tortoise burrow in a levee that's supposed to be holding back water obviously can impact the structural integrity of the levee. So that's one of the reasons that we relocate these tortoises. And if you look at over the, the photos we have to the, to the left here, you can actually see um, how we would do a, a mechanical excavation. There are several ways to relocate tortoises, but this is actually the preferred uh, method is to do mechanical excavations. And you can see that there is obviously an operator with a, a backhoe, and then you've got the biologist who is certified um, to do this type of work in the foreground, directing uh, the operator of the backhoe on every little step and making sure that the tortoises are removed from the ground safely and, uh, and in good shape. The recipient site actually saves the districts and taxpayers lots of money uh, for every tortoise we, we bring on the property. It's approximately somewhere around $1,400 that we're actually saving because if we go to outside recipient sites, that's what they could actually charge us. You know, the price can actually vary quite a bit, but the going rate is around $1,400 per tortoise right now. And of course, having the recipient sites expedites the relocation process greatly. So we can actually, it helps us keep projects moving. And of course, that's always uh, really critical is to keep projects moving without uh, as many, you know, keeping delays to a, to a minimum. And of course, finally, it also keeps gopher tortoises on public lands, which is, which is important. Um, and, you know, we're managed by the South Florida Water Management District. Um, and I will get into later how, how we manage some of these lands isn't much different than how we would manage the lands anyway. So this site is available only to internal district projects. So in other words, we're not competing with, with uh, public uh, recipient sites um, or not uh, private in, uh, uh, recipient sites, I mean, and uh, which was important. Uh, I do get requests probably about once or twice, twice a week on uh, what our prices are. And I just have to uh, let people know that our recipient sites only for South Florida water management use only. Uh, every tortoise that is relocated to, uh, to our recipient site is done under a permit. So there's actually three permits involved. There is the permit for the recipient site itself. There's a permit for every uh, relocation effort we do. And then the biologists that are involved in doing the recipient site, um, well, doing the relocation, they all have to have their own permits too uh, from FWC. And every tortoise that's brought on uh, to the property, we check it for its health to make sure that it's in, uh, in healthy, good shape. And uh, we also mark every tortoise so that we know every individual um, in case we run into them again or something happens to them, we'll know which tortoise it was. Um, the permit that we uh, received from FWC allows for 177 tortoises to be relocated onto the site. Uh, to date, um, over the past three years, we have relocated 43 tortoises to the site, of which uh, 30 of which have actually occurred during this year. Um, as the, the district's relocations uh, continue, the gopher tortoises on the property will become a more common site uh, and people will encounter them more regularly if you're out on the property uh, hunting or hiking or, or, or whatever. Uh, you're, you're going to be more likely to encounter tortoises on the property. With that said, uh, you have to remember that tortoises are a uh, threatened species in the state of Florida, um, and visitors are prohibited from picking them up, removing them, harming them, or harassing them. Um, and of course, that also includes damaging their burrows too. So, uh, you, but with all that said, uh, utilizing go. Uh, Fort Bassinger uh, as a recipient site 
is compatible with uh, the current public uses that were in place prior to the recipient site being placed there. In 2018, this was about a, a year after we had the permit um, in hand, the district put a fence around the, uh, the, recipi the recipient site uh, in an area that's approximately 180 acres. Um, the fence is buried 18 inches into the ground and that's to prevent gopher tortoises from digging out of the recipient site so they can stay inside and stay safe there. Uh, for those of, I always get questions of, well, if they can dig uh, so many feet underground, why don't they just dig way underneath there? But once they have dug to a certain depth, they aren't going to, they, they don't come right back up. They, they would just go continuous, continue down at that point and they would not come back up. So um, the only reason that we wouldn't have just a normal fence here is that if we had a normal fence, they might just sort of push the soil away and then eventually come up the other side. But when it's buried this deep, it sort of pushes them to to stay down underground if they're gonna dig a burrow there. Now, there are three walkover gates uh, that have been created for public access so that people can get in easier than having to get over the fence itself. Uh, there are, there's one at the parking lot and there's two in the rear that are over towards where uh, the Kissimmee River are. So that's where the, you can see the buried wired fence and that would be where the the walkover is. And I got a better look at it here. And we have signage on there to make sure people understand this is the designated access point. And we encourage people to use these as opposed to trying to step over the, the, uh, the fence because uh, we both don't want the fence damaged and the top wire on the fence is bob wire. So uh, it is three foot tall. So the bad things could happen. Um, and uh, for the most part, um, we want to keep that fence intact in so that we don't uh, have to uh, constantly repair it and everything. Now, as far as gopher tortoise burrows that you would encounter on the property, especially as we have more and more tortoises out there, um, public uses around a burrow should be avoided. Um, so in other words, uh, try to hike around or walk around uh, both the the burrow entrance, which is also called the burrow mouth, and also uh, keeping everything off of the apron. Now, and we don't want anyone ever messing with the, the burrow itself because first of all, there could be a tortoise in there that would be considered harassment. Uh, but also there's uh, over 350 different species that utilize these burrows, whether the tortoise is there or not. So if you were to stick your hand down in there, you might not find a tortoise, you might find an Eastern diamondback rattler. Um, so uh, basically keep your hands out of the, out of the burrows for, uh, for your own safety, really. And uh, also, we don't want people to really stand or walk on top of the burrows uh, to the best of their ability, uh, mostly because that's where the tortoises bury their eggs during their uh, breeding season. Yeah, the Fort Passenger property is managed like uh, all of the, the Kissimmee River uh, properties, and it is managed by land stewardship section here at the South Florida Water Management District. Uh, the standard land management practice of, you know, exotic plant controls and prescribed burnings, all of that, that, which we do on all the properties, is consistent with the Gopher Tortoise Management Plan uh, that was set up when we actually made this into a recipient site. In addition to that, uh, we do long-term monitoring of gopher tortoise population at the site. I'm actually in the middle of doing that right now, uh, doing uh, burrow surveys as well as uh, uh, surveying the, the plants and foraging conditions on the property. Um, and this is all done on a defined schedule in the permit. Uh, and even, it, even once we have all the tortoises on this property, uh, once we've sort of hit our max number that we can bring onto the property, we will continue to do this monitoring and as well as uh, management to manage for prime, for, for the best uh, gopher tortoise habitat we could possibly uh, keep out there. And at the same time, we're always checking that fence on a monthly basis to make sure it stays intact, just to make sure that we keep our gopher tortoises on our property. 
So that is my presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, I am available for questions now. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, Yvette, do we have any uh, public comments? Yes, we do. I have Mike Elfenbein. That was really cool. Um, thanks for sharing all that information. I'm, I'm fortunate to live in Charlotte County and we have gopher tortoises around our entire house. We share our leftover vegetables with them on a regular basis. They're, they're kind of like a part of our family. But I, I was curious, um, in the things I've learned about gopher tortoises, they, they tend to stay like within 150 feet or yards, but not very far from their home. And I wondered what that does to them when you take them from where they live and put them somewhere strange with other established individuals, do, do, do they, like for example, with panthers, there's interspecific inter aggression where uh, they fight for territory. Does that happen with your gopher tortoises? Do you see them uh, having difficulties when you just let them go somewhere and say, be on your way? Well, uh, the aggression between two panthers and two tortoises, uh, drastically different. <laughs> but um, but yeah, mostly what we see when we get to tortoises out on the property is they have a tendency to wander for a long time. And that's another reason for having that fence there because they could wander just completely off the property. And if you don't relocate a tortoise that far from its, from where it came from, they may have a tendency to try to get back to that location. So it, there is, um, I'm not gonna say it's not stressful, but I will say that it is the property that they're bringing onto is managed in a much better way than where they're coming from uh, in, in, I would say 99% of the cases. So um, there is an adjustment period for tortoises. Um, I think there's still a lot of research on this, uh, but uh, for the most part, I think that they have seen that as far as adult tortoises go, um, they do fine eventually. Uh, they do adjust. Um, I think most of the aggression that what you might be talking about is where a tortoise sees a burrow and it's like, oh, I'm gonna go get in that burrow. And then another tortoise comes out, but no, you're not. And um, so that's, that's, probably uh, most of the sort of the interaction you would see as far as that goes. But eventually you get tortoises uh, with a lot of the relocations we've been doing this year, we've actually seen a lot of uh, tortoises already starting to uh, dig their own burrows at this point. And uh, so that's, that's really good to see. Next hand raised is Paul Gray. Please unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you, thank you. Yeah, um, you know, this could sound some people like on, on these creatures, but one thing that just recently happened at Archibald, which is pretty weird, the Archibald Biological Station, they've, of course, they've got a lot of tortoises. And there's some guy driving through there and he pulled over and picked on tortoises and was going to go home and eat it. And um, turns out his girlfriend didn't like that idea. And they drove all the way up to around Melbourne or somewhere and they got in a fight over it at a truck stop. And they were fighting so uh, much that they, the truck stop called the police about this uh, domestic dispute. And the police got there and found out they were fighting over this turtle that they wanted to eat and she didn't want to eat it. And then he saw it was a gopher and he called a wildlife officer. And the wildlife officer's like, why well, you can't eat that thing? And the guy got arrested, but it turns out they figured out how, where it came from. It was Archibald because it was a marked tortoise. And the wildlife officer's daughter, while he had it in possession, knew that they ate vegetation. So she went out and picked grass and, and, and leaves and stuff for it to eat. So it was well taken care of. Um, but it also turns out that this tortoise was 57 years old. And so, you know, these are really, you know, being in the turtle family, they, they really live a long time. And I don't know if you know of any older what, what the longevity record is, Brian, but it's just, you know, these are really significant creatures. So it's kind of a, do you, do you know what their longevity is? I believe that 50 and 60 years old is, is, is an old tortoise, but I, I think, I don't think that's unreasonable uh, to get for them to get to those ages. Yeah. So, but yeah, they're, you know, they're, I guess the, from from your from your comment, Paul, um, 
there there is can you know can always going to be concern that people find these locations if they're going to uh, want to to consume the tortoises. Um, best I can say is that you know we do have uh, FWC patrols a lot of these properties and. We hope that that is sort of enough to keep someone from thinking this is a good idea because um, there's they're obviously a threatened species for a reason and um, and we want to maintain the, the populations we have. Mr. Cook, it's the final. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian, for our uh, great presentation. Uh, uh, up where uh, we have a small farm near Palaka, uh, believe me, there are a lot of gopher tortoises on the uh, nearby properties. Uh, they are very common, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's always a good idea to uh, uh, understand how these things are endangered, but they also are being protected and are doing a pretty good job here in Florida. Uh, thanks to the uh, FWC. Uh, next on the uh, agenda is uh, Jerry Krentz, land steward at Senior Planner. And uh, this is public use uh, updates on different projects. And Jerry, if you're out there, it's time to start. Jerry, you do have control. Jerry, I'm going to take control back again, and then if you can unmute yourself. Okay. I can hear you now in passing okay. control. There we go. Thank you, you have control. All right. Um, my name is Jerry Krenz and I've worked with South Florida Water Management District for, I hate to admit it, probably 30 years, 25 years. So anyway, it's a long time. Um, I've worked on a public use for quite a while and we have, um, I usually do a public use you know, project update and that's what we'll do tonight. Um, mostly uh, the discussion this evening is really about um, a lot of our construction projects that we're doing and, the, and how we coordinate with our recreation and where we are on that on these projects. And I, I think it's really worthwhile pointing out that, you know, at the water management district, we have a very specific mission uh, for water management and all of our projects uh, serve a project purpose towards that water mission. And um, so our use of the properties for public use is secondary to that. And so while we try to coordinate as much public use as we can with our projects, uh, construction rules in that sense, because it's part of the project purposes. And this discussion will probably show you to some degree how closely we try and coordinate that and keep as much of our uh, hunting seasons uh, incorporated into our uh, projects and how we coordinate around the recreation as much as we can. So this uh, will have three areas, um, our hunting on the STAs and the modifications that will be due to construction that we have which this year we have a, a very large amount of construction on the uh, SDAs and it's primarily with SDA two and uh, SDA one West at this time. And then also our uh, SEP South project in the L67C area. Uh, I'll discuss access and the closures in that area. And then also with the A1 FEB, which is the flow equalization basin. It's become a very popular area off of US 27 at mile marker 60. Uh, we have recreational access there. And there we have um, the development of the A2 project, which will create um, a reservoir and an SDA. And that is immediately west of this. But in order to get to the A2 project, we go through A1. So on to the next slide. Um, at the STAs, our, uh, these are the hunting changes um, for alligator which is that season runs August 15th to November 1st. Um, we've added the STA One West expansion area um, 
we've added that to the one west south hunt area what that does is uh, help us ensure that we'll be able to hunt that south area or hunt that put on that hunt because it's in one west area as well one west area is uh, about 4500 acres adjacent to one west and um in this hunting area we got a north hunt and a south hunt and um we felt that we could complete this hunt pretty much we may have to end the hunt by october 15th which is shaving off a couple of weeks um, if our construction goes absolutely on time um so we let every we let all the hunters know go ahead sign up for the hunt you may get cut off towards the end i don't really know if that's going to happen but this gives them a good chance to get out there and get their gator and we do have uh data we collected in the past and showed us that uh, most of the hunters uh, go on the first weekend that they are allowed to go and most of them get both their gators on the same day so we find that by this time of year um by the time October 15th rolls around, most of the hunters have gotten their gator. So we thought it'd be better to go ahead and have the hunt and maybe shave off a little bit rather than cancel the whole thing. Um, on uh, waterfowl hunting in the STAs, I said this mostly affects one west and STA two. Uh, like with the alligator, we took the strategy of uh, adding um, uh, the south hunt. We added that to the STA one west expansion hunt so whereas we would have lost those two days um, when they closed the STA 1 West South, uh, we have those now on, one, on STA 1 West expansion. So we'll get to use those two days. And then um, on STA 1 West, the North Hunt, which um, is uh, regular season, we have early teal. Um, this year we'll have the early teal there, but we have to wait for the contractors to tell us exactly what projects they will do first within the SDA and we'll see if we get to have our regular season. It's a little bit uncertain, so we're waiting to see for that. Uh, we have that same situation on SDA 2 um, where we're going to open that up for early teal and it looks like it would be closed for regular season except for uh, this has been a very dynamic season and uh, we learned this morning that it looks like we could open up SDA 2 and we work very closely with FWC and they've been very positive with us uh, on all our changes. And it looks like we're gonna get to uh, open up SDA2 for uh, the first two phases of the regular season. It's gonna be a much smaller hunt than usual because we um, also have another construction project in SDA2 in which we already lost half of the north side of the SDA2 hunt. So we will have um, the early teal will be a full size hunt. And then we will have the SDA two regular season for the first two phases. So we will get the first Saturday in January. That's how far we'll get. After that, um, we'll have to yield to the construction. So we did get a little more than we expected this year. Um, and uh, SDA one West, um, we are looking forward to potentially getting to hunt in that area. And uh, we're scheduling our uh, early teal season. That way we'll have the check station set up. We'll have the parking set up. We'll run that early teal season and we'll watch closely with the construction. And we are told we should hear from the construction management group, maybe mid October, November, and see if we're able to get in there and do some hunting for the last uh, couple phases of, of that regular hunt. FWC is uh, very prepared to help us with this. And um, actually, um, I think uh, Justin Bingham's online, he could describe to us, but if he's there, we have, uh, they've devised a way we could use the reissue permit process. And if anybody wants to ask about that, Justin will be available when we have uh, our questions. Um, by doing this, it minimizes uh, the time delay associated with establishing the regular draw and waiting for that to go forward. Um, one other little thing we got working on is also in SDA 1 West, on the very north end of that SDA, we will more than uh, likely have to look at a concrete batch plant being located there. Again, that's another one of these construction issues. It's up to the contractor 
as to whether or not he'll need that. But if he needs that, we'll look with him. We will work with them on locating it such that we can still um, access back and forth from our check stations to our uh, hunting areas. Um, also in the SDAs, as most of you know, besides hunting, we have regular public access, which occurs um, Monday, Saturday, Sunday, or Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And um, in both these SDAs, we have truncated the um, public use area slightly to continue that while we do have construction. This uh, is affected by a project in STA 1 East that is hauling in and out of 1 East, it hauls in 1 East and then out through the refuge across through 20 mile bend going out. So it's affecting our um, trail that goes from 1 East to 1 West. The uh, public times will remain the same. There'll be no changes on that. Now, um, far south, we have uh, the SEP South project. Um, we have contract one, which will make changes to um, the L67A and C levees and set up a couple of structures in there. And the, this uh, small slide, but the small slide, which is labeled L67C and L67A are where there are boat ramps. And um, when the SEP South contract starts in the winter of 2020, and I'm not sure exactly when that date will be, it's depending upon how procurement with the core goes, the um, L67C location that you can see on the map will be closed because they will haul in and out of that area to do their construction work. And so this actually closes the boat ramps into the L67C, the canal itself, and the pocket, which is an area between the L67C and L67A. And then also up by the L67C on the marker, there is a new airboat ramp that goes into the Water Conservation Area 3B that we will have to close for a while. We hope to reopen these um, later on when we get an opportunity to, to uh, reevaluate with the cores once they have started some of the work and have used up a lot of the fill on the area we may be able to work with them and rearrange the staging areas and so forth to do that. And maybe we can get people back in there. Um, the L67A bow ramp that's at this site is able to remain open at this time. So we'll hopefully uh, work something out with the core and uh, have to go through about phase one of the uh, number one contract. Um, now we have uh, A2 construction and the A2 construction will be for several projects that are not shown on this map, but are west of this map. What I want you to see here is the uh, A1 and mile marker 60 is where we normally have public access. And we will be moving the uh, public access probably in the winter of 2020, maybe three or four months down to mile marker 53. What this will accomplish for us is allow the um, construction activity that's entering at mile marker 60 to follow the red line on the A1 FEB and they will go west and then south and that way they will be on that levy and we will keep the public use open on the blue levees. And so in effect, we will uh, keep you know four out of five of the boat ramps available. Each of those boat ramps has parking and um, this will segregate the uh, traffic. So we do not have conflicts between public and uh, construction, which we, we can't mix that kind of traffic. Um, there will be no changes to the days and hours of public use and the recreational use and the activities we currently have will continue. They'll just be um, the limit on using the uh, levy on the um, Northwest section as it shows in red there. And that's really uh, short and quick. It kind of outlines where we are with coordinating with uh, construction on recreation activities. And I can, um, and I can answer questions now. Uh, Jerry, uh, thank you very much. First, before we get to the questions, I spent a lot of time with Jerry. We ride a lot of levees uh, over the years. Uh, FEB, I think we first went out there about 2004, 2005. 
uh, I can only tell you, if it was not for Jerry and the land management staff, who spent a lot of time working with the contractors and working with the planning, uh, our access to all these properties would be very much less than what it is today. And I know it's aggravating sometimes when you say, well, I lost that boat ramp or I can't hunt on that sale on the SDA. But the fact of the matter is, is these guys are working every day to try to keep those areas open as much as possible. The SDAs this year are a real problem, and we're still working mm -hmm. on that. And I think we're going to end up with a lot of more hunting than we actually thought uh, in the beginning. Already SDA 2 is a little better than it was. So I can only take, pay you how much we appreciate it, Jerry, and what you guys do to uh, keep the opportunity for us as much as possible. With that, uh, Yvette, do we have any comments? Yes, we do. We have David Rodriguez followed by Baron Moody. Hey, can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jerry, Newton, everybody else on the call. Um, regarding A1, FAB, and A2, are there plans or intentions on leaving public access open at mile marker 53 uh, after the A2 project is complete? Um, the A2 project is real, is uh, an STA and a reservoir, and it looks like it could go on for like at least eight years. And so we anticipate really using that uh, mile marker for the site. And, um, but after that, uh, it, it's possible that would move it back up to mile marker 60 because our access route to the new reservoir and the new STA is being built from mile marker 60 going in to the west. So I really think we'll see that move back uh, to the north. That's about eight years from now. So we'll see what happens then. But um, we are going to have access on A2, a, a deep reservoir, and A2 STA. And that access comes from mile marker 60. Thank you, sir. I, I just want to break in here a moment. Uh, Jerry, I don't have to tell you, but we made that ride about, what, 2004 or 2005 the first time. Uh, there's a lot of work goes into this public access. It starts 10 years before it's available. And just think, if we made that ride in 2004, 2005, that area, the A2 uh, reservoir, will probably be finished around 2028, maybe 2030. So uh, I just want everyone to understand how much effort goes into this uh, work to get the public out on the water on the district lands. And, and without the cooperation of the uh, of governing board and the staff, uh, these things just would not happen. So thank you very much, Jerry. Yeah, you're welcome. You know, when I started working on these projects in the late 90s, when we started with the um, Everglades restoration, one of the core economists told me that he's worked on a project from the first day of his career until the last day of his career. And I laughed about it, but I'm realizing it now. I've got the same thing. I've, there's projects I've been working on for 15 years and they're in design and they're being built and so forth. And it really takes, um, you have to watch them for a while and keep up with them. We have another question, um, Yvette. I have several speakers as Baron Moody followed by Mike Elfenbein. Good evening, this is Baron. Um, I, I'm a little disappointed in the L67C situation. Um, we had discussed a very, I thought, more agreeable to the recreationalist solution a few weeks ago. That's not what, what we're seeing tonight. Um, and, you know, the L67C has gotten impacted by repeated projects. You know, we've lost the boat ramp near the 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 memorial site the value jet memorial site that's only recently been kind of replaced and now the replacement is being closed um i i'm i'm disappointed and i think users of the area will be as well um that boat ramp represents an opportunity that lets anglers from the dade county area fish a little bit of area that not everybody else is going to be fishing because they don't want to make the drive down from Broward or something to fish the L67C. And, you know, 
the fact that the anglers have a special name for the place means that they do value it. You know, that was always known as the little L and it was a special place to a lot of people. So I'm, I'm really disappointed. And I hope we push the Corps of Engineers hard to find a way to get that, that access restored sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you, Baron. And I, I'm kind of disappointed too that we had to close the bow ramps. And as it turns out, um, the Corps is going to be hauling from the very west side of that um, site over to the uh, north and then out through the east. And there was really no way to put boats in there and boat trailers and parking and uh, not have the haul routes cross the public access routes. And their contractor is uh, starting soon. When they complete phase one, uh, we are going to try to reassess how that's done and reorganize things. And we see that this site could be used over and over in the future, like the A2 site itself, both of which are SEP uh, plan projects. And we hope to develop a, a segregated site where the, you know, one portion of the site would be for recreational use that could continue on. And one portion of the site would be separated into construction because this site could be used for staging for uh, several other projects in the future. Yvette, do we have more questions? Mike Elfenbein, followed by John Monty. Mike. Thank you, thank you, Jerry. Jerry, great job, man. And you know, and, and I said this at the last meeting we had is um, you always do a great job representing the sportsmen and the stakeholders and listening and engaging and addressing and um, kudos to you, sir. Uh, much appreciated. Um, but you'll you. remember my uh, la at the last meeting I mentioned to you, and, and I want to reiterate it. And uh, it's it's not meant towards you, just more in general. But um, these are public lands. These are public waters. They belong to me. They belong to you. They belong to the public. Um, and it just seems to me like, in the name of projects, the public always gets the shaft. We always get the short end of the stick. And the contractor, they get their money. They, they get their, their millions or billions or whatever it is they're being paid. Their, their people get their jobs. Um, the district or the agency people keep their jobs. The budgets keep cycling additional millions of dollars. Staff continues to keep their jobs. And the only person who lose, the only people who lose consistently is the public who owns these lands and waters. Um, and I, I can't stress it enough is the contractors, the district, the core, the agencies, this work should, public use and recreation should be at the forefront and con of consideration when, when making these projects and making these decisions. The, the continued, well, you know, it, uh, a public road crosses a hauler's road. Listen, we, we all drive on the road with trucks every day. Um, yeah, I get it, things happen, but th there's no reason that that the public needs to continue to lose. Um, th those, those boat ramps are used not only by the public, but by people who depend on them to make a living with their airboat tours and concessions. Um, we're disrupting a lot of the public who owns these places to conform to the needs of a couple of contractors. And I just uh, wanted to emphasize that, but thank you so much, Jerry, for all your work and uh, your continued effort. Keep up the great job. Thank you. Um, you know, I'd like to, I would like to point out that um, we do have recreational features in the, um, in these projects as well that will get incorporated. Like we will have more boat ramps and parking at this site when all these construction projects are done because each SEP project has um, public access. Like with the A1, when we uh, have to yield to construction to come and go, think of it this way, they're building two more projects we're going to get to play on. So we do get something out of it in the end. And um, we try hard to work with uh, getting the construction and the recreation and not losing out on it. But there are times just when the construction just needs to have a way to get through there. It's the way it goes, I guess. Um, John Monty. Hey, Jerry, how are you? I'm doing good. Seems, uh, seems things are very dynamic as far as when it comes to the construction issues since we last talked. Uh, I was curious 
Um, the Saturday hunts at STA one. Uh, if they do take place, do we have a time frame of knowing when? Yes, we do. Um, this is a rather a, a procurement process. Once they have a notice to proceed, the contractor will have 30 days to lay out his schedule of projects for us. So not sure exactly what date that will start, but we expect to hear something probably like late October, um, early November maybe that would tell us what schedule of projects they're gonna do, what schedule they're gonna do their projects on in the SDA. That's when we should hear if they will actually be hauling on the north side of SDA 1 West or not. And then we'll know if they're really gonna be interfering with our uh, Saturday hunts. So we look forward to hearing from that and we'll be able to then add uh, those hunts if we can. And, um, you know, would, would you like to hear from Justin Bingham on how we plan to do that? Because he could tell us that, um, that process. Well, that, that was going to be my next question. I guess I, did, I do have to take it up with Justin. I, I mean, it's great news that STA2 will be open this year. But as you know, the Waterfowl A applications are already taking place. I'm not quite sure how we're going to allow users to apply if they've already put in for the permits, seeing how STA2 wasn't on the list to procure a permit. That's your question to Justin Bingham, I think. I, I, I agree. You know, I agree. Yeah. I'll take it up with him. Yvette, um, we have Justin on the side yeah, here. Yeah, I can. I can answer if you'd like me to. Can you hear me? Hey, Justin. Hey, John. Yeah, so the we know that phase one is already open for regular season period A. And so we did have, uh, we were able to put a youth hunt back on that's going to be held at STA 1 West um, on November 14th, the morning and the afternoon youth hunts. And so the way we're going to handle those is we're going to put them up in phase four reissue period. The reason we wanted to do that is because phase one has already begun. And during phase two, if you were somebody who pulled a permit during phase one, you wouldn't be eligible to put in. And in phase three, that's first come first serve. And so some people because of their work schedule would be at a disadvantage for being able to be first in line, so to speak, to put in for those permits. So we felt like the most equitable way to handle this would be in the phase four reissue period. So for that uh, November youth hunt at uh, STA One West, we're gonna make those permits available in the re return reissue period. And we're gonna do the same thing with, um, with STA with STA two. Uh, the, Jerry and I talked earlier along with Marsha and, and Andrew Fanning, the waterfowl coordinator. And we've talked with some of the higher level folks at, at the district and um, FWC and to, to make that happen, to make some of those uh, hunts available even though, as Jerry said, we'll have to offer fewer permits, but we figured something was definitely better than nothing. Um, and so because period one or phase one has already begun for that, we'll handle that the same way. We'll put those permits up for grabs um, in, in the random draw in return reissue period. And then for period B, we'll be able to hold those in the regular, uh, according to the regular draw starting in phase one. The plan for STA 1 West for the Saturday hunts, like Jerry said, is uh, sometime between October 15th and November 15th, we'll get word from the contractor whether we can hold those hunts or not. And that is the date through FWC, we've said uh, mid to late November, kind of to give us the ability to have as much time as possible if we need it to be able to determine whether we're going to be able to hold those hunts or not. And so we've we've had to go ahead and cancel the the regular season period A for STA 1 West. But um, the reason we were able to make that uh, that youth hunt work is because we can hold that on either unit. So we'll, we'll go ahead and hold that on the Friday, Sunday unit. And then for um, periods B and C for STA 1 West, if we're able to hold those hunts, you know, if construction allows us to be able to hold those hunts, then we'll probably have to issue the period B in, depending on when we get word, but most likely we'll probably have to issue the period B in the phase four reissue period as well. And then phase C will be able to be held starting in phase one like normal. Um, and so that's kind of our plan going forward. I don't know if you have any other questions. Let me know if I adequately addressed your questions. Yeah, Justin, I think it's great news. Um, my only question left would be, I have to go back and look but in phase four, is a user allowed more than one permit? So 
like can a youth get a youth hunt permit and also be afforded the opportunity to get an STA2 permit or is he that youth just going to be stuck to to either or Did I make sense with that? Oh, so, sorry, I, I accidentally muted myself. Um, I, as I understand it, if the youth are able to get a regular permit. I don't think they're excluded from getting a, getting a permit in the regular draw if they obtained one in, in youth. I'll have to look into that for sure and I, I can get back to you. Okay, yeah, because I know now the youth hunts are separated from all the other hunts. But I don't know if you mix them all in with the phase four, I'd have to go back well, and make sure that that's it, a so so what sorry I, I need to clarify it's the it's just the phase four reissue period for youth hunts so that's that's held separately so gotcha. that youth hunt will be available in the phase four return reissue period just for youth waterfowl and so that that will be a separate draw from the regular season period ABC gotcha thanks sounds great thank you Jerry you're welcome thanks, John. Mr. Cook, I have no other public commenters. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to uh, thank John for all the hard work he does. Uh, John is constantly uh, working with us on, particularly on the SDAs, and it's it's very very helpful. Uh, I will also, uh, just as a side note, United Waterfowlers uh, is uh, hoping that we can have a uh, a conversation with the contractor uh, on the uh, Saturday hunts on SDA One West because uh, we, we see that uh, losing that sale uh, costs about 1,500 hunting opportunities uh, for the year. So hopefully we'll be able to get some uh, good news regarding the hauling on Saturdays uh, during the period from, from uh, uh, November 20th through February 14th. With that, we can move to our next uh, speaker. And uh, uh, Dan Cotter, the land stewardship section leader. Uh, and I just wanna make a few comments before Dan starts. BJ Cattell, who has been a wonderful person and great help to me and to all the stakeholders for from the day that I started doing this about the year 2000, He's about to retire and God bless him. Uh, I haven't worked in 20 years, BJ, and uh, you will enjoy it. But uh, I hope you find something like <laughs> I did. I hope you find something like I did to keep you busy every day because it definitely is important to your life. So BJ, do you have a couple of words you would like to say? Thank you, Newton. Um, I think I will wait uh, Till Dan is done, uh, I really appreciate uh, your good words. Uh, I'll wait till Dan's presentation is over. If you could give me a few minutes after Dan's presentation, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dan, you do have control. Okay, thank you, Yvette and Newton. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I've got some updates uh, on facilities and, and some new recreational access. Um, hopefully some good news for everyone. Some of it's a follow-up to our last meeting um, and, and the status of that. So I will go ahead and start. Okay, Lakeside Ranch Phase 2, um, just a little background information on Lakeside Ranch STA for those of you maybe not familiar with it or haven't been there before. Um, it's, it's a northern STA. It's located in western Martin County on pretty much the Okeechobee-Martin County line um, in between uh, 441 and uh, the B line. And it plays a, an important role in the restoration of Lake Okeechobee um, watershed, improving the quality of the water flowing into the lake. Uh, the wetlands there at the STA um, treat the runoff from the Taylor Creek Nub and Slough basins, um, which are just north of that area, uh, that runoff before it enters into Lake Okeechobee. 
phase one, if you if any of you have been there before, that's about a thousand acres of the Lakeside Ranch STA. We opened that in, in 2016. Um, and just recently, um, a little over a month ago, we opened phase two um, on August 7th. So now the whole uh, STA is open to the public and uh, it's about 2,700 acres. Um, if you look over to the map on the right hand side, you can see phase one is, is in the north um and phase two which just opened is in the south and this is you know is really popular for all the activities on similar to our other stas um and it's open the same hours um sunrise to sunset on friday saturday sundays and mondays but what i really wanted to highlight is a new parking area um beautiful park area and i give credit to our engineers uh, who coordinated that with us the development of that that's uh, we call this the south parking area now and that's the one that's new that just opened up right off of uh, 441 that's about two and a half miles south of uh, the road that leads to the northern access that was open for the last couple years um, so if you get a chance yeah go on out there it's a really really nice site and so the facilities at that area, you know, we've got parking. We actually have two parking areas, the new one and then the, ex the existing one on the north side. Um, there's restrooms. This picture to the right up top is the, is the new parking area. Um, got restrooms, kiosks. Uh, there's shelters, um, not only at the, this new parking lot, but out on the levee trail. Um, if you look at that picture at the bottom, that's a good example of uh, one of the new shelters with kiosks that as you're walking along the trails, you can stop. There's also a larger kiosk, uh, shelter out along there in, in the phase one. So now with this site open, there's about 17 miles of, of trails for hiking and biking. In addition, you know, the Martin County Audubon, when we first opened phase one, now runs tours during the, you know, the cooler months of the year. So those of you that are uh, interested in going on uh, a birding tour, uh, get up with the Martin County Audubon tour um, or the Martin County Audubon Society there and they'll bring you on a tour there. Okay, we're gonna kind of jump around the, the, the entire district. Um, I had mentioned this last uh, meeting, um, site one, for those who aren't familiar, it's in Western Palm Beach County, just adjacent to the refuge, um, about six, a little over 1600 acres. It became real popular, particularly these last couple of years. You know, the site's very developed uh, residentially, particularly to the south, a lot of new development went in there along Parkland. So we've got a lot of people wanting to access the site for hiking and biking, wildlife viewing, but particularly birding. Um, we are going to put a new parking area there off of Locks Road where that arrow is. Uh, that, uh, the good news is that's now under construction. Um, it's just adjacent to the Hillsborough Canal. So there'll be a nice grass, you know, stabilized parking lot there. And we're gonna put up some signage and so forth. And I wanna give uh, credit and kudos to the Fort Lauderdale District uh, Field Station for helping us implement that. So. Between now and the next meeting, we uh, that should be open, that new parking area. Okay, to jump down south, something also I had mentioned um, last meeting, down in Miami-Dade County, adjacent to the C-111 off of Ingram Highway, um, there was a, a parking area that was uh, there several years ago. Um, it's no longer available due to the installation of a, a new structure several years ago. So we are putting a new parking lot on the new, north side of Ingram Highway, where that arrow is. Um, that parking lot is, that parking lot is under construction. Um, it's about 90% complete. Um, it's a very large grass parking area that's fenced and has got uh, two walkthroughs through it. So this is important uh, for hiking and biking, wildlife viewing, but particularly the horseback riders. Uh, for those of you that were at our couple meetings ago, we had the president of one of the clubs down there and they will use this. Uh, it'll uh, be able to accommodate uh, horse trailers. Um, and again, this is something that's 90% done, so I expect this to be open within the next month or so before our next meeting. 
Okay, now to jump over to the West Coast. Um, and if you haven't been there before, um, at our crew bird rookery swamp uh, area, this is located in Collier County. Um, this is a very popular site. Um, we have a boardwalk that uh, is fairly close to the parking lot. And it's important boardwalk because it ties into old tram trails, uh, about 12 miles of them because um, you need to cross the marsh uh, to get to these trails. So that boardwalk over the last several years, we've been replacing the decking and now it's complete. And so you can kind of get an idea what the old boardwalk looked like on the left. And now we've got the, the new boardwalk complete with composite deck. So that is done. And if you get a chance, um, do try to go out there. It's a beautiful area. Also in crew, um, in the Flint Pen Strand, um, which we, you know, we've developed three new parking lots there, I've mentioned several times. Um, one of the most important roads, uh, particularly for hunters, uh, is as you come in the entrance and make a right to what we call Poor Man's Pass Trail. Um, we've got about a mile of road there that we're improving. Uh, that should be complete actually within the next two weeks. The contractor's gonna start there this, uh, this week to add material to that road. That leads to one of our new parking lots uh, for public access and also is a hunting access um, to the Poor Man's Pass Trail. Um, to jump up north, uh, for those of you that um, have a chance to uh, visit these sites, um, we've got some really nice areas up there, Shingle Creek and Lake Marion Creek management areas located in Orange, Osceola, and Polk counties. Uh, Shingle Creek's in a fairly urbanized area, but it's a beautiful site. It's got a boardwalk and plenty of trails to walk on. Um, our land management staff up there has added some new kiosks uh, throughout the site. And in addition to that site, they've added uh, kiosks to the Lake Marion Creek management area, which has several um, access points, and that's also a hunting area. So these kiosks are brand new, most of them, um, and they look great. And I give kudos to our land management staff, but also our communication staff who worked on these kiosk panels with us, uh, numerous ones of those that have graphics, maps, and a lot of good information in them. Okay, uh, jump back down into Okeechobee County. I want to just uh, kind of get the word out that um, Nub and Slough STA is under construction. We've had some people show up uh, thinking that it's open for public use. It's not because it, it's under construction. They're doing some work on the levee there to enhance the site. But in addition, um, that construction is also including um, a future public access uh, point that will go from the future parking area, which is adjacent to the B line, um, to allow people to get right from the parking lot up onto the levee. So they'll be building a ramp levee there, um, which will enhance the access. And that should be complete in spring of 2021. And then we'll mention that and keep you posted at future meetings. Okay, I um, want to jump to the Kissimmee River public use area, and this is kind of a notice to, you know, many of our users who are hopefully online on the Zoom meeting um, who have helped us out. You know, we've, over the last several years, um, taken a giant stride to um, delineate the Kissimmee River with airboat signage on both sides of the river. Um, and that took a lot of volunteer time, uh, a lot of buggies, uh, airboats, and a lot of signage, um, just like you see here in this uh, picture. Um, we probably did approximately 30 miles of, of signage, and we've got some more to do to the north. Um, unfortunately, we've heard from uh, law enforcement over the last two or three months that some of the signs are being taken down by individuals, whether it's just off the posts or they're pulling the posts out. Um, we wanna get that word out that it's important that those stay in place. They're not easy to install or easy to get to. So if you see or hear of that, please let FWC law enforcement know or district staff, you know, feel free to call me. Um, we've now had to go out and replace some of those signs. So I just wanna point that out again, that, that was a lot of volunteer hours um, and it was an important project to delineate that, that airboat line. 
Um, a little update on the COVID. Uh, might have given you an update uh, last meeting. You know, all district lands are open for recreation. Um, this this sign that you see to the right, we we you know just want to get the word out to continue to practice social distancing out there. Um, most of our camping areas were reopened June 5th. And the last uh, four remaining camping areas, Hickory Hammock, Dupuy, and Estepoga, and Crew, um, we're planning to open in October 2020. Some of those have larger facilities and restroom shower facilities in them, and we'll have um, enhanced cleaning at those areas. And last but not least, um, as Newton then mentioned, and this is one slide I, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, we're doing this by Zoom, but I, I wish we were all in person um, at our meeting, um, you know, recognizing BJ's, uh, everything he's done for the district's recreation public use program and, and to congratulate him on his retirement. You know, I consider him a really good friend. Um, he's probably been one of the best employees I've ever worked with. Um, you know, it would take a long time to mention all his accomplishments over the last 18 years just with the district. Um, you know, he was part of the initial team that opened, that started this meeting that we're having today and back in 2004. Um, as part of that team, he's opened up an additional over 140,000 acres. Um, you know, he's coordinated numerous public uh, use facilities throughout the district um, and kudos to him on, you know, he's, he's really brought the district's volunteer program to what it is today. Uh, huge projects with huge user groups. Also, he developed the campground host program too. Um, so again, there's just numerous uh, initiatives that um, were achieved because of BJ's efforts. So with that, I'll, before I turn it over to question and comments to um, the audience, BJ, if you're on, uh, if you want to say a few words. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I thought I would just quietly sneak out and nobody will notice it. <laughs> now, now the cat is out of the hat. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Thanks, Dan. Thanks for the kind words, uh, compliments. Uh, yeah, in 18 years, uh, when I came to the district from uh, FWC, uh, we had bare minimum in recreation program. So I was only one. Then we have now, once you, you came, then Jerry came, then we had a team. So with the team, you know, I don't want to take all the credits, but I'm a part of the team that uh, we have developed our recreation program from, it has evolved tremendously uh, in the last 15 years or so. Uh, like you mentioned, the volunteer program, we save hundreds of thousands of dollars every year through the volunteers and uh, uh, it was, and then uh, I would say, I, I, you gave me, you and Steve, you gave me all the freedom, kind of freedom, of course, <laughs> you know, uh, that which was good for the uh, district and the programs that I, anytime I proposed anything, brought in and you never said no, but we would refine at times, but uh, definitely you supported all these and that's the reason where we are today in the recreation and public use program. Well, for many uh, who are uh, listening, I maybe, you know, right now, for the last few years, I've been in the project, capital projects, and the district with its, uh, you know, project management training, SAP, it has made me a good, good project manager. And one thing I would like to say here is my 23 years, almost 23 years here in Florida, my home has been here uh, for 23 years. And right from the first day, uh, there are two people who I'm associated with are Steve Coughlin and Jim Sooty. Uh, we've been working for the last 23 years together. People come, people go, but you know, that's uh, normal. And uh, other thing, a uh, few other things that uh, 
I would like uh, to thank everyone. Dan, uh, you are not, like uh, you said, you are not just my supervisor, but we have, I believe, we have developed a way better bond than supervisor and employee. Uh, so is with the team that we have, uh, uh, I call it district family. And at time of hardship, uh, that, that family really uh, was, uh, you know, backing me. And uh, so it, everything is good. You know, uh, we developed uh, cooperative agreements, the templates we still use. So all in all, I really appreciate all your support and uh, think that uh, I did propose there are a lot of things to be done, but hey, you know what? I may be retired next month, but I will not be tired. So uh, last more than 40 decades of my mission to conservation works has not that been my passion and will not go away. So next time when I come to uh, the RAC forum, I will be a general public. So I really appreciate uh, and many of the stakeholders uh, that you know me, uh, I have had a really good uh, relationship and really good working. Uh, we all work together. So that's really nice. So thank you, Newton, and thank you all. Uh, I didn't want to take all the names individually on uh, my bureau, you know, the, the Rory and everybody has been so nice, business and management. And the other thing is, it's a teamwork. District, uh, anything we do there is a teamwork. If a capital projects come, uh, there would be recreation component. Uh, there would be exotic control. Uh, that would be another component. So it has to be, uh, you know, coordinated effort. And uh, one time I was just, uh, I, I never hesitated to take, uh, to, you know, new challenges. Like uh, we had FAST team. I was a team advisor. FAST is, you know, focus, action, solution, timely. So, you know, that consensus building and bringing the issues that we may have in construction of this and that, uh, make a team, uh, have everybody discuss on that and find a resolution for that. There may not be 100% uh, one person would like to have uh, the other person, but it's a consensus build. So I was part of that too. So I, I think uh, my experience with the district is, you know, it's a treasure. I uh, will, uh, whatever I do, you might ask me, well, what are you going to do next? Well, I may utilize my PhD in wildlife and go find some critter and follow it, which I haven't been able, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been able to do for a few years, or you know, I might just do that, or just to sleep um, ten hours a day and eight hours a night, so eighteen hours of sleep over twenty-four hours. I don't know, but. I will definitely will not uh, add, and thank you all. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you, BJ. Thank you, BJ, and I can uh, only tell you it's been a real pleasure all these years uh, to work with you, and uh, I can tell you that when we started years ago, uh, there was a lot of locks on the gates. A lot of gates were closed all the way from Orlando uh, to the Tamiami Trail. And you were a big part of getting a lot of those locks removed and those gates open. And we will always appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess next we're looking for any public comments on uh, Dan's presentation. Yes, we have um, three hands up. And before we move to public comment, BJ, I want to wish you the best of luck. I know we've worked together in several past teams and thank you. Our uh, next commenter is Andrew Burnett followed by Mike Elfenbane and Brandon Jane. Hello? Yes, Mr. Burnett, we can hear you. 
Hello, Mr. Dan. I just wanted to say a very thank you to uh, your presentation. You did an excellent job, uh, along with everybody else that presented in this uh, whole entire presentation. Um, I just wanted to go back onto your, um, they have the project going on over there at the end of Locks Road with the parking lot. Um, will that hinder anybody from using the ramps over there? And my other question was, will there be any other projects going on over there? Andrew, um, no, that will not hinder um, th this park parking area is, um, I don't know the exact distance, but it's quite a ways from where the boat ramps are into the refuge and the conservation area there. It's more to the east and uh, yeah, so I know. that will I not hinder that. that. I just wanted to make sure because, you know, we're uh, camp owners out there in area two and I just wanted to see if that would, would uh, if there would be any chances of them maybe uh, you know, it would, uh, like I said, hinder any way of being able to uh, cross paths over there. No, I don't see that at all, Andrew. And I don't, um, besides the initiatives that the refuge are doing that were mentioned earlier, which are all great things, I don't know of any other projects that are going on there. So I don't see any hindrance. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate the answer. And I just wanted to verify with that in case of anything, you know, I've I wanted to watch out for in case if I couldn't get out to camp or anything and check out on anything. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dan. Mike Elfenbein. Hey guys, thank you. Um, Dan, great job, I appreciate it. I was, uh, so Bishop was having trouble getting online and he sent me a message and he's asked me to relay a message to BJ um, he wanted to congratulate you on your retirement and, and acknowledge your dedication and all the hard work that you've done uh, for the district, for the stakeholders, uh, saving money uh, by relying on volunteer programs. Um, Bishop, Bishop says that uh, whoever, whoever replaces BJ will have some big shoes to fill. So BJ, um, from the sportsman, uh, for myself, I echo that sentiment, and uh, thank you very much for all that you've done in your service to the district. Thank you so much. I appreciate the kind word. Mr. James. Yes, um, I just have a question uh, I said earlier in the meeting, and um, it's about the boat ramps off of 27 north of the alley the first and second one i was just wondering what's the status on them and um just you know th those are the easiest ramps to to access the area for me and to get to our cabin mosquito lagoon so i was just wondering if there's any updates thank you hey this is dan i i do not have any updates i don't know if there's um anyone else on the line or from FWC that has any updates. You're talking about the two boat ramps uh, on 27 that were managed by DOT, right? Lose him. Yvette, did we lose the uh, individual? Yes, Speaking. we did. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Mr. James, could you please raise your hand? Okay. Um, Yvette, Todd, I, yeah. I see. Yeah. I see that uh, Yvette. I see that Tom Reinhardt has raised his hand. He may have some input um, from FWC on on this question. Okay, um, Mr. James, could you please mute? Okay. Yeah, this is Tom Ryder. Can, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, and I've got an echo, so I'll try to power through it. I, I wish I had a better. Ooh, that's terrible. <laughs> Hold on. 
Mr. Reinhardt, you're, you're muted. How about now? Okay, that's, I think that's better. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I, I wish I had some um, additional news. I, I have been reaching out to DOT, and, and I got an email back from them today saying they were going to uh, bring this back up with their uh, their their crew out there. Uh, the, the bottom line is DOT has the uh, the proper. I think they've got responsibility for those properties, and they want to release that back to the water management district. The issue is finding someone to take on the management of the parking area, and that's the maintenance and trash removal and thing, which is not something that FWC can do. Uh, we had um, uh, discussions with Broward County to take over one of them, but that has uh, they've had some other priorities that they've had to focus on. So it's uh, unfortunately it's still a little bit in limbo, and that's really uh, the best. Uh, information I've got right now. And again, I, I did have a, an email from DOT that they were going to review that again, but that was I, multiple prompts from me, got an email today and I had told them <laughs> we've got a meeting tonight that this is probably going to come up. And uh, and so they, they, are, they are looking at it. So I think this is, again, something that's in limbo for a little while. And, and you know, we would like to see uh, one of those ramps open. Um, I, I, I don't think there's a need for both of them. But there's a lot of issues with regards to the exotics on the right of way that shield that parking lot from view, which makes it not very safe uh, for long term parking. Uh, and then there may be issues at the ramp and if there's issues at the actual ramp itself. That's something FWC may have funds for uh, or it can be put in uh, as an application for our, our voting improvement grants. But the day to day maintenance, trash removal, that kind of stuff is not something that FWC has funds for. So. Uh, we would need a partner along those lines. Thank you, Mr. Reinhardt. Well, next we have Rand, Brad Weinenbrock. Can you please unmute? There you go. No, we still can't hear you. Um, sorry, we can't hear you. Let's move on to Paul Gray. Mr. Monty is next, John Monty. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my question is to Tom, Tom Reinhardt, if, if he's still on here, I don't know if he is or not. Uh, in reference to the ramps along US 27 and having them man maintained, I was wondering if Tom knew who maintains the ramp at Johnny's Bass Hole and the sub canal, since they're, they're in such close proximity, I'm not quite sure how those two ramps get taken care of, but yet these two two other ramps that were closed, apparently there's an issue with them. But maybe, maybe Tom knows the answer to that. Tom, please unmute. Uh, that is a good question, John. And I, I don't know if Baron Moody is still on. He may know the answer to that. I do not know the answer to um, Johnny's bass hole, but I don't imagine there's a lot of maintenance needed. It's a fairly small ramp, but I, I don't know uh, who who maintains that from a, a trash collection perspective. I really I, so I, I don't I do not have an answer to that. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Mr. Cook, I have no other public commenters. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Dan, for your presentation and uh, appreciate all the uh, questions. Uh, and so we'll go into our last uh, uh, issue here, the recreation discussion. Now, what we do here is we open the forum up to anyone out there who would like to raise their hands and uh, propose something that we might put on the agenda for the next meeting. Or if you have a specific issue that you'd like to discuss, uh, we do have a few minutes. So if anyone out there would like to participate in the recreation discussion and also perhaps suggest some future topics, now's the time to raise your hand. Mr. Cook, I have a number ending in 6323. Yeah, it's me again, Newton, John, Rosier. I just was, uh, I was gonna say when Jerry was talking, but, but uh, as far as the STAs, I just have two questions that I always ask them. I'm gonna keep asking them that, down the road, is there any way possible that you could get a midweek hunt down there? I'm not asking for me because I don't duck hunt. But a lot of people, you know, can't make it on the weekend or something like that. So, and I know the thing about construction, but maybe we could get a schedule far enough in advance where some of those STAs that people go duck hunting on, we could have them open on like a Wednesday or something like that. And then the only other question is, are you still having hog problems in any of the STAs? That's it. Thank you. Mr. Not, a question, not a question I can answer, but perhaps uh, Jerry or Dan. Yeah, this is Jerry. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right, good. Um, well, regarding the midweek hunts on Wednesdays, um, you know, we did add the Friday hunt uh, to waterfowl hunting, and um, currently we have most most of our staff, not all, but most of our staff works in the fields are uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And so I don't really think that we would be able to move to uh, having a Wednesday hunt. That's just one of those things where we're typically out there working. Uh, if we have contractors that come to work, they need to know what days they can get to. It's pretty much a, the same answer that I um, have given before on that. It's probably things just haven't changed. And um, the only SDA that we've, we've ever really had very many hogs on was SDA 5. And I, I have not heard that we're having problems with hogs out there. And um, that's, sorry to say, that's the way that is. Thank you, Jerry. Do we have any other uh, people, Yvette? Yes, we do. We have Paul Gray. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Yeah, no, I, I was just trying to say thank you to, to BJ. And, um, you know, I grew up going to natural areas and parks and areas never really thought much about how much work it was for a whole bunch of people to make those things available to us. And, um, getting into the business and finding out how hard it is to acquire land and manage it and make it available to the public. And, you know, you've been doing that for everybody. And you're kind of one of those people behind the scenes who've made so many opportunities for so many people who will never know of you. Um, but on this call, uh, I think people do. And I just want to say thank you so much for your work and your you're uh, making this available to a whole lot of people who will never be able to Mr. Cook, that's the last public speaker. All right. I, I just want to take a moment because Bishop Wright could not get on the call for one reason or another and uh, drop back uh, to the uh, Marshall, off of Marshall Oxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge and the progress, it's been tremendous progress that was made there in terms of more public access, particularly hunting. Uh, Bishop has been uh, the leader of the uh, group of uh, sportsmen uh, at what we call the trust group, uh, working to put together the 
a new National Wildlife Refuge up at the headwaters uh, north of the Lake Okeechobee. And as part of meeting, I think it's almost 10 years now of meetings, the end result of that was an incredible amount of additional access to the federal refuges uh, in the state of Florida. And I just wanted to recognize Bishop for that. And uh, I hope he gets one of the airboat permits at Loxahatchee because he's sure been working all these years that at least get some token airboat access out there. And with that being said, I want to appreciate all the people who joined with us tonight uh, out there on the Zoom meetings. Uh, we all hope one day that we'll be meeting together in face-to-face, uh, -face. but I, I suggest that we'll probably keep the Zoom access because I know there's people out there a long way from, from West Palm Beach that can participate using Zoom. Uh, Drew, I don't know whether you're still on, but if you are, if you had any finishing comments, they would be appreciated. Absolutely, Newton. Of course, I'm still here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Yvette, Devon, and, and Henry for making these meetings work. Um, I, it, going to Zoom was a challenge, and we made it happen. And uh, we are going to continue using Zoom, even when we start meeting face-to-face -face again or some sort of remote participation because we have had a, an uptick in participation uh, because of the remote access. I also want to thank Marsha, Veronica, Brian, Jerry, and Dan for your great presentations. As always, I learn a lot about what goes on at the district during these meetings and it's quite impressive. And I'm really proud to be here at the district and be able to present what we do um, here at the district. And BJ, thanks for all your service over these years. Uh, enjoy retirement. Uh, continue to visit. Uh, you're always be welcome at the district. And I, I, I heard a lot of great stories about you and, and just really appreciate what you've done for us. Um, even in my short time, it's, it's just amazing how all the effort that goes into this kind of stuff and then the payoff with the, with the public actually being able to use our 400,000 acres. So thank you for that. And Newton, of course, thanks for hanging in there and, and really helping facilitate this uh, rec forum. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Drew. Uh, the next recreation forum is scheduled for December the 14th. I hope all of you will join us. We will work real hard to have a good agenda. I have a lot of interesting things. And uh, unless there's any uh, discussion, the meeting is adjourned. Thanks all for attending. Thank you.